Spirits and privateers, hope you can hear me. How are we all doing tonight? I'm just trying to figure out if my audio settings are correct, if the music is too loud or too quiet. And once I know that, we'll do a proper intro. Hell, good lord, there's 350 people here. Jesus Christ. Okay, looks like people can hear me. That is excellent. Excellent. Good. Seems like things are the way they're supposed to be. Well then, hello, pirates and privateers. My name is TB Dikayan, apparently, according to chat, but rather spelled with an S, so you might think it was TB Skyen, but no, as chat have sussed out through detective work, my name is actually TB Dikayan, and I've been lying to you all this time. So, it's time to be pirates in Legends of Runeterra. Uh, because pirates, good bilge water thing. Riot have released the new. Rising Tides set for Legends of Runeterra, a game which I have sunk a distressing amount of time into, honestly. Uh, a lot more than I ever thought I would. And they've also been kind enough, um, because of, apparently because I've made those other videos reviewing card art uh, for Legends of Runeterra, they were kind enough to reach out and say, hey, this new set is coming up. Why don't we just give you enough wild cards to buy everything in the set, and then you can make some videos about it. So that's disclosure, as it says in the lower left corner of the screen. They did do that, uh, but that's not going to stop me from complaining the way I always do anyway. So the way things are going to go is we're going to hit up the various cards inside Legends of Runeterra. We'll take a look at them, we'll analyze them, talk about them, how do they portray the characters, how do they like work within their remit in order to portray a cool, interesting scene, what do they do with the character designs, oftentimes some very good stuff. Legends of Runeterra has character design that's way better than base League of Legends, in my opinion. And we'll do all of the new Bilgewater cards, of which there are a lot. And then we'll head through, unfortunately I've got a list of the new cards. We'll head through each of the regions, and we'll take a look at the new cards that were released for each one of them as well. So... Uh, super chats are available if you want to ask me any questions while we're doing this. You can also do that with uh, uh, donations on Streamlab. I'll try and, and, and keep up on them. I've got things popping up. I'm not an experienced streamer in terms of Streamlabs, uh, so give me a second and I'll try and get to, to everyone in case anyone says anything. Or else just sit down and watch and listen to me ramble about pirates for... I don't know how many hours, it's probably not going to be as many as my... Originally, I did the stream where I reviewed every single card in the base game. That took a while, um, but... <laughs> but, um... I think with the only 120 cards that are being add added to the new set, we should probably be good on not uh, spending too long on this. And we'll start with, well, the one-cost elusive little bastard, Fizz, who is definitely going to be annoying me in all of my games. I play Poro decks, I don't want this! I can't deal with that. Anyway, so um, a lot of the illustrations and, and the work that's being done on Legends of Runeterra is being done by outside contractors working with Riot. In this case, this is an illustration by the Studio Six More Vodka, who were responsible for a huge number of the cards in the base game as well. There's also a couple of other studios who have contributed, as well as some internal artists at Riot themselves, who have done some work in, in creating some illustrations. And there are some interesting differences, I think, in some places between the art styles of the base game and the art style of the expansion. It's not like, it's not massive, but there seems to be like tiny little shifts in a few things in terms of how they present the cards and the card art, which is probably just because the artists like got better since the, since all the work that they, you know, did on the original Legends of Runeterra. Anyway, Fizz. So something you'll remember um, if you watched the previous many, 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 many hours <laughs> of card analysis is that one way in which these cards tend to be constructed is uh, there's a use of staging and framing in order to guide the eye and in order to highlight the important part of the picture. For example, Fizz, of course, being the main subject of the Fizz Champion card. And something I didn't talk very much about last time is that each card also, of course, the art has to be constructed in such a way that you can put it into this little, what is this, like a 9 by 16 
uh, frame of a card and still have the art work and be readable, even without all the context of the scene around it. And so that's, uh, Fizz is kind of a good showcase for that, because look how he's framed against the ship. Now, Fizz's own colors, very saturated, like he's very blue. He's a, he's a very cartoony, colorful character. And then look at the environment around him. We've got all this, like, fairly drab brown, lots of, like, it's just, it's a pirate ship. There's not a lot of color on there anyway, but you see all this shadow and shading, kind of keeping the pirate ship from being too bright and too colorful on its own. So we've only, in terms of the major colors here, we've only really got fizz and then the contrast with, of course, the oranges, which seems to be an ongoing meta narrative in some of the Bilgewater cards, is like oranges and what happens to them. Um, in this instance, Fizz is messing with them and they are unable to hit him because he's a bastard. So Fizz, with his bright blue colors, stands out from the brown, like mostly brown background. And he doesn't fade into the bright blue sky either because the contrast is really strong. Because okay, this is a very, very bright blue. This is a very dark blue. And that's also why the angle is the way it is. Imagine, for example, if Fizz had been framed like against the backdrop of this like dark, heavy wood back here. That has a much uh, darker tone and that would kind of make his little blue body which is fairly dark like highly saturated and fairly dark in contrast um fade into the background a little bit more so having a lot of bright space behind fizz helps frame him like it helps draw the eye to him it helps center him as the object of attention in the image it's just also something that's helped by his trident and like the like you can kind of see how between the the barrel and the net and the sail and then like uh the ship itself, the the mast is the word I'm looking for. There is kind of this like you instinctively kind of know with your when you look at the picture that this stuff right here is not important. It's stuff like outside of the frame of the main action. So you don't focus on that. Your eye is drawn right here to the major character. And then from Fizz, you go to the other characters in the picture, which is also partly because the human eye is programmed to search for faces in everything. That's why you have the thing called pareidolia, where people will look at like a chair and see a face in it because it's got two holes and like a little scratchy line on it, things like that. But the human eye uh, looks for faces. So the first face you look for obviously is Fizz, the biggest face. Then you kind of go to the pirates here in the background and you kind of notice, oh, Fizz is jumping around and being a little shit and knocking barrels over and getting shot at and laughing and having a great time because he's too stupid to understand what a menace he is. And then you go to the big dude here with the hand cannon and sec this sagat looking motherfucker here in the background uh, ready to start a street fight a brawl. And then that kind of leads you finally to this character up here. Who we don't I don't know who that is. I don't know if they appear somewhere else in the set. It's entirely likely. Um but who seems to be some kind of leader because they are positioned like above the rest of them, looking down on them with his raised fist of command, which is the kind of framing that you often do for a character who's like an officer or a captain or someone who's in command of the troops down on the lower deck who are chasing Fizz around. So besides like the obvious stuff of just like the kid, the, the, the little shit in the middle of the picture, you've also got like this little miniature story being told at this, this guy's like, get that little shit, I can't hit him, Captain. Hey, hey, I'm Fizz. And then he's jumping around and doing things. And that's the thing I love about Legends of Runeterra cards is they're so good at doing storytelling in their little panels so that the characters become more than just, oh, here's a cool mage who casts a spell, but there's something else going on. Oh, uh, Jean-Lin Halen, I wanted to thank you for introducing me to Final Fantasy VII. It was very relaxing to play a feminine male who looked exactly like me in physicality. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. It's a very good game. Moving on to his evolved version, to his upgraded version, the one the way you really start to feel hateful and salty. And again, you can see the same thing is going on here. He's a little bit brighter here because he's out in the tropics in bright sunlight, but same thing going on. The, the water and the cliffs provide a kind of frame that sort of guides your eye to, okay, here's where the action is. Here's where we want to want to be looking at. And then Fizz's higher contrast, like his darker colors compared to the sky, helps, helps him stand out from the clouds in the background and the stuff that's going on there. But then there's additionally the little thing of the water here, the little barrier of the water, which then creates a different frame for, well, Longtooth down here, or as I like to call him, Bruce um because i've watched finding nemo too many times hanging out in the in the side of the frame where like outside of the context of knowing that fizz has some control over the shark it kind of looks like the shark is eyeing him up for a meal doesn't it <laughs> 
At least it does to me. And here's um, also an example of, of uh, a particular angle. Like, in order to get the water barrier to sort of only, like, to not be, like, taking up half the screen or the bottom of the screen, but to taking up a corner, you do a Dutch angle. And a Dutch angle is when you, instead of having the camera aligned with the horizon, camera, I say, it's an illustration, but you get what I mean, you tilt it to one side or another side, which creates a feeling of instability in the viewer, especially in moving pictures, um, which here is grounded a little bit by the fact that the shark... Like, if you rotated this picture so that the waterline was even with the horizon, so that it was, it was horizontal in the image, what you'd see is that Brucey here is actually kind of pointing downwards a little bit, but because our perspective is tilted, we are looking straight on at him, so he looks like he's kind of horizontal in the picture. And that grounds the image just a little bit, so it doesn't feel too wibbly wobbly But that chaotic sense of, 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 of like instability is also good for Fizz, because that's his energy, that's his personality. Um, he is an unstable character who like creates chaos in the environment everywhere he goes. You can see the same Dutch angle is being employed right here. We're not looking at this like straight on horizon uh, flat to our eye line. We are at a Dutch angle as though he has just knocked us over, almost which again helps give you that sense of, of the kind of person that he is, the kind of behavior that he has. Then we have Longtooth here. Or Brucey, <laughs> who gets his own card as well. Um, where what I like about it is like, it's, it's a very simple card. There's not a lot to say about it, but I do like the revelation that you get. Like here, it's just, Bruh, I'm a shark popping out of the water. And then you actually look at it and it's like, oh, he's chasing these superbly ridiculous looking animals because he is endlessly and infinitely hungry. Here, there's much less of the framing thing going on. There's that, not that much of an environmental composition. Like, the water helps, uh, like, create a space for him to dominate the picture by taking up, like, pretty much this entire area is dominated by him. It's under control by him, with these things clearly being driven out, fleeing away from him. Even another shark over here is, or seems to be running away from him. And then another thing I love about Legends of Runeterra cards, they're not afraid to be ridiculous. Like, look at these stupid looking fish making <laughs> look so dumb and overwhelmingly cartoony. And I like that because like League of Legends, God love it, can often get too serious. I think like it, it often takes itself a little bit too seriously. And I like it when they get cartoony and just like mess around with things just because they can. So moving on to my girl, my... Good lord, my my thin-waisted girl, <laughs> Miss Fortune, who has a really interesting um, base version of her splash, like especially compared to uh, other champions. Let's uh, try and see if we can find some champions to compare to. Like you see someone like uh, Braum, for example. See how he's framed in his version of a champion card. Like, he's dominant in the frame because, of course, he's the champion. He's the powerful guy. Punching out a troll, having a great time, laughing. Same thing goes for a character like uh, Fiora. She's very much the center of attention of her picture. Like, she's in control of the space. She's lit up. Her opponent is in shadow. Oftentimes, when they have champion cards, the champion is very much the focus, like the center of attention of the image. With Misfortune, the mood is a little bit different because she's a relatively small figure in, in the image. In fact, her, like, whoever, the Skimbleshanks, the pirate cat, uh, whoever this may be, piloting the side of her ship and the other characters, she's not really highlit or super in focus. She mostly gets space from being, like, hanging out over the edge of the boat, being contrasted against the background of the sky, and the composition kind of gives her gives her space to breathe, but she's less overwhelmingly the focus of her base version, which is a very different story than, like, when she levels up. Then, un in, undeniably, she's controlling the entirety of the space and everything is about her. But I do like the mood of this as a piece. Um, also because the version of Misfortune that they're using here is sort of, seems to be kind of an interesting halfway mix between the Misfortune that we have in-game and the misfortune that uh, that exists in the League of Legends lore. And I think there was a thing, let me see. Oh, uh, Mr. Mine HD, this is my very first tip, and you are my first streamer that I want to watch live. My favorite card from the new set is Nautilus. What is yours? We'll get to mine. Don't you worry. And thank you for the donation. Um, 
What was I saying? Right, misfortune. She has, there's kind of two misfortunes in League of Legends. There's the one that we have in game, who is like big titty, lusty pirate maid flirting with everybody who's literally one of her abilities is to strut and wiggle her ass and be sexy. Like that's, that's one version of misfortune. Then we have misfortune in the lore, who's like a badass pirate lord of Bilgewater who doesn't take shit from anyone and who can be like, use her sexual vials to blah, 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 but who's not like primarily about that. Who's much more restrained in terms of her sexualization. I like both versions of the character. Like, I, I I, think League of Legends could do with a big titty sexy pirate maid who's just walking around with big red hair and being hot at everybody. And I also think League of Legends does well with, like, a badass, I'm gonna kill everyone who stands in my way and control Bilgewater misfortune as a counterbalance to Gangplank. Here, they kind of seem to have wanted to split the difference a little bit because they've certainly reined in her bust size a little bit. And they've kind of reined in the whole sexy flirtation, I'm the hottest thing in the world and you can't stop staring at me energy that she otherwise has in favor of something that's a bit more subdued and practical in its expression, but sort of kind of kind of trying to strike the balance between the two versions of her. And certainly they've gone with the more flirty version of her in terms of her voice lines. I don't know if anyone's heard them, but they got uh, data mined before the game came out. And her voice lines are like, basically every time a hot woman comes comes onto the play field, she flirts with them. And if she faces herself in a mirror match, she tries to flirt with herself. So like, she's thirsty. Uh, and I like that. Now, one thing we're going to have to comment on, though, is she doesn't seem to have spleens or a liver. I'm not sure about intestines. Maybe there's room for them in there once the spleens and the liver are gone. But there's, oh boy, this is like, there's not, there's not a lot of waste here. So this is, <laughs> this is stylization. Obviously, this is stylization. It's meant to make her look more skinny and attractive, I suppose. But it does kind of straddle the line for me where it's like, okay, like I get it. You're making her like hourglass shape, thin, like wide hips, big booty that I get what you're doing. But at some point my brain just can't help but go, but she doesn't have any organs like this. It's not comfortable. Something's wrong here. Like my brain just rebels against it and says like, yeah, surely she has muscles in there somewhere, abs with which to hold her body upright. I don't know. Back muscles, does she have them? And that's kind of, that's a strange line. That's like a personal preference thing for you because for some people, this is not going to be a problem at all. They're just going to look, oh yeah, it's fine. Who cares? Um, because they're used to seeing those kinds of figures. For me, because I'm used to thinking about these things in terms of like, what does what kind of anatomy does an actual person have? It looks uncanny. Like it looks like it's like a little too much. And there should be just a little bit of room for like something in here. Personal preference thing, I think it kind of sucks a little bit because a lot of the characters in Legends of Runeterra are designed the same way. Like it's not a unique thing that they're doing only for misfortune to really hyper emphasize the hourglass shape and make her extra sexy. It's just that, especially Six More Vodka, stu this studio just draws all of the ladies that they get their hands on like this. And it's. It's kind of boring. Anyway, let's return to the composition of the image. So, once again, we're dealing with a Dutch angle, which we're going to see a lot of those, by the way. You can see the horizon. The sky uh, is right out here. This is this is the horizontal line. And again, the image is tilted. But in unlike with Fizz, um, his images where we're kind of off balance, almost as though we're falling, here, the image feels much more imbalanced because while we are, yes, tilted, uh, compared to the horizon, we are stabilized compared to the ship itself, the thing that Misfortune is sailing on, which adds to the feeling of going through a chaotic environment, but being in control of it, which of course is the feeling that they want to project with Misfortune here, is that she's hanging lazily off the side of her boat as, she, boat as she's cutting through the ocean waves, commanding her crew of hot ladies um, to do pirate stuff on the high seas. She's in control, like she's she's controlling the sea, she's cutting through the waters, she's off on an adventure. So all of that is in service of giving this feeling of misfortune as someone who is powerful, not necessarily by dominating and taking up the frame, but powerful in the sense that she is in a chaotic environment, but she's perfectly stable. She's controlling the environment, she's commanding the ship, and she's like, she's the leader of the expedition, which is what the framing does. And this, this is where they do something interesting with light, because normally, 
Like we talked about with Fizz, you'd like to have a very strong contrast between the main character that you want the people to focus on and try and sort of blur out some of the environments a little bit. Usually the way you do that is to have the thing that you want to focus on in light, just have it lit up, have a spotlight on it, and have stuff that you don't want the audience to focus on be hidden in shadow. Here, six more vodka studios are doing something a little bit more, a little bit different and interesting. The characters in the background, like the lady up here, the lady below decks looking out, like the cannon and the ship and the stuff like that, all of this stuff is hidden not by shadow, but by glare. Like the glare of the sunlight that's hidden behind the hair of this lady up front is basically kind of creating a little fog over them that kind of washes them out and prevents their detail from taking focus away from Miss Fortune herself. And then they use shadow over here on the left with the girl who's backlit to make her kind of fade out a little bit. So Misfortune is not lit up as such, but she's the only one who has like a neutral contrast, who isn't in shadow or who isn't like occluded by god rays, by, by, by rays of light or a haze of light, which is an interesting way to do the, to do the composition. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That was her base. Let's move on to the... How long have we been going? Oh, good. 20 minutes, and we've been through two cards. <laughs> ah, yes. I said at the front this was probably not going to be that long. I was lying, and I was wrong. So, first and most obvious thing once again, we're not... We don't have, like... Uh, it's not... It's hard to tell whether this is a Dutch angle exactly, but there's a couple of things going on. First of all, you're looking up at this mast of what seems to be Ms. Fortune's ship based on the two guns insignia at the back there, which matches the two guns that she has on her hat. But it's as though she has knocked you down, almost. Like, it's as though you're on your back looking up and she's just kicked your ass to the curb and she's basically flexing on you, like doing a T-pose with guns out. <clears throat> um sort of in control. And again, this is the way that the framing of the image helps reinforce the dominance of the character who you want to be in control. Miss Fortune here is dominant both because like she's got the arms spread out wide, the guns like pretty much taking up most of the image all on her own, but also because she is above the viewer and looking down on them, specifically looking down on them, um, which puts her visually speaking in a position of power which I can see chat is reacting to that appropriately by saying, step on me, mommy. <laughs> which, yes, that is actually, that's that maybe not necessarily a sexual feeling, but that is the kind of feeling that you're supposed to have is big strong woman has kicked you on your ass and she's in control now, not you. That's, that's the feeling you're supposed to have from this. With an interesting addition to misfortune being the powder monkeys here, which I haven't been 100% able to figure out, um what the heck the deal with the powder monkeys are. I think they're like magic spirits that inhabit her guns and allow her to do her magic abilities with the guns, which would be an interesting retcon of her character, actually. That's, um, that's unusual. Uh, I'm gonna leave it to Necrit to maybe figure out if that stuff has been teased in the lore already, because I can't remember. But that would be an interesting way to add some more mystical dimensions to the character in her relationship with Bilgewater, because up until now, she has just been a lady who shoots guns real good. And it'd be nice to have some magic also mixed into that to explain how she can shoot up into the air and then bullets fall down and kill people. Let's see, what else? Right, um, Miss Fortune's posture is an interesting action line, because usually when you have, a, like, a character who's, like, dominant in a frame, who's looming over someone... It's, like, unusual to have them also lean and tilt. Um, but in this instance, I think it's supposed to communicate the idea that you're standing on, like, the swaying deck of a ship and gravity, like, your center of gravity is shifting all the time, left and right, as the ship is tossed about in the waves. And she's keeping her balance by leaning into it as she's got her guns out firing at people who, fortunately for the viewer, aren't you, even as she's clearly flirting with whoever she just knocked down. I mean, look at that face. Anything else interesting in this image? No, it, well, except that the composition is a lot more chaotic um, compared to the previous composition, which is very, like, there's lots of action going on here, but it's also pretty stable. Like, you've got the ship stabilizing the image, you've got Misfortune hanging off the ship, the horizon line in the background. This one here is way more chaotic because you've got stuff and shrapnel and boom, and the, the fire flying everywhere. So this is clearly in the middle of a combat scene. And so the feeling of, of rootless chaos, I guess, works pretty well for the scene. But it was 
I, I, I used this um, for the thumbnail for the thing, and it was actually kind of hard to edit into a thumbnail because I kept having to move it around to make it look well, com uh, better composed, you know, to fit like the stale energy of a thumbnail rather than the madness of a combat scene. Okay, let me check in. Holy shit! What the fuck are the 900 people here? What the hell? It was 300 like 10 minutes ago. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Um, I'm looking at all the cards in Legends of Runeterra. Hello. I, I hope you'll enjoy it. Right. Where were we? Twisted Fate. That's the one we're looking at right now. So again, um, we've talked about some of this before, but we'll mention this a million times before we're over. Twisted Fate is in a frame in the image, and he's being framed by a couple of things. First, there's the table, which is sort of our baseline. We've got a Dutch angle again. You can see that the horizon line is not stable, but it's not as extreme of a Dutch angle as we've got in other pictures. Then T Twisted Fate is boxed in. He's boxed in between the pirate dude on the left and the pirate dude slash biker gang guy from the 80s over here on the right, both of whom are like creating a little enclosed space for Twisted Fate to be in. Now, when you do that compositionally, like when you box one character in between other characters, that's a really good way to make a character feel trapped, like they're caught, like they are unable to escape from whatever is chasing them or whatever is cornering them. But that's not the mood that you get from Twisted Fate. Twisted Fate is in control. He's calm, he's relaxed, his posture tells us so. He's throwing his magical cards around, he's smiling, he's not even looking out at us, looking up. He's looking down because he's confident and his posture tells us the same. Like shoulders wide, arms out, arms spread out, which is what you like in 80s um, business manuals would see called a power pose. Um, but that's what it is. Like he's showing us visually that he's in control of the space, that he's in control of what's happening, even though like he's in a tense situation where if these guys get mad at him, it doesn't look like he has anywhere to escape to because behind him there is wall. And to the left and right of him, there are big pirates with hook hands and tattoos and biker vests. <laughs> Twisted Fate teaches pirates to play Uno. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I would, I would, real, I would kill for a set of Uno cards, but with Twisted Fate images on it, I'd kill for that. I, that riot, get on that, get on that immediately. And then there's light. Remember how in the Misfortune um, base splash we talked about how light can be used to highlight a character and, and make them the center of attention in the image? Well, that's exactly what's happening here. We've got the candle down here, first of all, and then we've got the magic light of Twisted Fate's magic cards, which he's definitely not cheating with. Um, casting this golden soft light over the character himself, which puts him in contrast, like all of Twisted Fate's colors, are right, like of a warm variety. You can see like the, the the mossy red pinkness of his skin, the brown of his leather coat, the red of his vest, and like all the uh, highly saturated colors of his cards and his hands. Puts him in contrast with the background environment where you can see it's much more bluish, blue, gray, brown, very muted, very unsaturated fading into the background compared to him. And the same thing is happening with the other guys. You can see that the light is also playing on them a little bit. Like, it's lighting them up a little bit, the light of Twisted Fate's magic playing on their skin, but most of them is in shadow. Like, most of their bodies is in shadow, and therefore, like, visually speaking, less important, and also less uh, highlighted than Twisted Fate himself. So just by using the composition to create a frame and using the light to highlight the character and then like creating color contrast, you can draw the eye completely naturally to exactly the subject that you want to look at. And if you do done it another way around, say that Twisted Fate had been in shadow and this guy had been lit up and like the, it was Twisted Fate and this guy who was sort of looking at him, boxing him in, even though he's like way out here in the composition, way out on the on the left, you can use those same techniques to highlight a different part of the image if that's what you want, if you want a composition that does that. Um, because it's so powerful, just light and color and and like a little bit of framing, and you can you can draw a viewer's eye absolutely anywhere you want. I need something to drink. Right. I think someone in chat, when is someone going to hire you for like a mobile game or something? I don't know what I would bring because like I'm not a good enough illustrator to draw like this. <laughs> like they need illustrators who can draw this stuff, not just a guy who can sit around and talk about it. 
Ah, anyway, where were we? Twisted Fate. Here he is, leveled up. And again, the frame is right there. You have the arched doorway here at the back that creates this this uh, circular space, this, this rounded space, this frame for Twisted Fate to fit himself into. But here you also have a different feeling. Like now the Twisted Fate, here Twisted Fate is setting up the sting. Like he's setting up the gamble, the, the con that he's running. And he's under pressure. Like these guys are watching him carefully. If something goes wrong, they'll be on him. So he's like, so there's this feeling he's in control, but he's also like, there's also this slight sensation of he's a little bit trapped in the image. See the contrast with the leveled up version? Here, no one is trapping Twisted Fate. Everyone is basically behind him, staring at him, like in rapt awe. Like, what the hell? How did he do the whatever magic thing he just did? And here, Twisted Fate, rather than being enclosed by the frame that's used to highlight him in the image, he's breaking out of it. Like, he's literally extending his hand out of the frame itself and presenting his magic cards, which I'll never get tired of calling that magic cards, even though it should be magic cards. Because I like to imagine that Twisted Fate would be really into magic if he lived in the modern world and he'd just win all the time. Like, just always top-decking exactly the right thing and no one can prove he's cheating. Um, but here he's breaking out of that frame, completely in control of the entire scene just by taking up most of it. And again, same techniques with lighting being used. Rather than the light of his magic, though, he's being lit from above by... Something that kind of looks like sunlight, but presumably couldn't be? Who knows? But he's lit up, and his colors are generally very bright, and everyone and everything else is in shade and in darkness, so that none of it draws too much attention. And the only things uh, that we actually sort of have our attention drawn to a little bit are people who are like, Whoa, How did he do the magic thing? Who are astonished by him. All of which... Um, like, just, just highlights the sense of this guy having the power, being in control, being the best in the room at what he does. I do like the old man in the background over here. I wish I could zoom in on him more, but I do like... He's such a Renaissance painting character to me. Um, if you look at uh, a picture like um, Caravaggio's The Card Sharks, um, you'll find characters like this showing up in it with, like, with the little half glasses and kind of balding with cards in hand. Old card sharks. Um who infest the taverna of, of like, uh, Renaissance Rome and things like that. He's just a nice little character design. I also wish I could get a better look at that lady back there, because she seems to have a really interesting face. But I'll have to find the high-resolution card art later and have a look at it. Okay. Uh, these are... Yeah, so there's not much to say generally about spell cards. Um, so unless there's, like, a some unusual reason to do it, we, we're not going to bother taking a look at it, because they're basically just icons... Like, no characters, there's nothing, there's nothing artistically that interesting to talk about in them, I think. <sighs> right, uh, let me have a look at chat so that, like, I don't... In case you guys are saying something, I'm not completely ignorant of it. No, it seems to be good. Cool. So, this character right here, this is, we're talking about Gangplank, but take a notice of this character right here and this one right here, because I think both of them show up on other cards elsewhere in the set. I know this guy does, he's an orange courier, uh, kind of character. Anyway, Gangplank. So, here the framing is a little bit different, because there kind of isn't really one. There's a couple of things going on. We have, of course, like the... The railing of the ship where he's stamping on some aristocrat's hands and throwing him into the water uh, to be consumed. That's happening. But outside of that, like, unlike with Fizz or Misfortune or um, Twisted Fate, there's not a clear frame in the background that sort of, um, that, that highlights gameplay. Instead, what we have is a series of converging lines. Take a look at the sails here, the big black sails and the, the railings coming off of the mast here. Take a look at, like, the general directionality that all of this stuff is pointing to. All of it kind of creates this swoop that leads us down, like, that leads the eye to focus on these things as areas. And the same thing here with the lines coming off um, in the background here. There's a lot of stuff that sort of just gently points you towards Gangplank. Like, if your eye catches here, it'll follow the line down, and then, oh, there he is. And if your eye catches up here, then you get drawn down the line and over there. So it's like a very basic compositional technique that you'll see everywhere in, in classical painting. Um, 
but that's just being used to draw your eye to Gangplank. Then there's the second part, which is the black sails. Like, the sails are matte black, and they are in the background, so they're even, like, their color, or rather their contrast is even more washed out. And Gangplank himself is highlighted with bright sunlight, shining off his pauldrons, shining off his... I'm not sure if this is his post... Burning Tide's robot arm necessarily. I think it probably is because Gangplank has some of the some voice lines that uh, reference the Burning Tides thing. But I thought he lost his whole arm and not just the bit from the elbow up. Um. But yeah, this is very matte and 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 sort of uh, subdued. But then Gangplank himself, all this golden light, all these shining like the 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 bright orange, and like the light coming off the side of his hat and the gold on his shoulder, his brass um, shoulder plate, all of that is creates this brilliant contrast against this matte black background that again helps highlight him as a character. And even though the other characters in the background, you can see the sunlight is hitting them directly. Like they're getting the same sunlight that Gangplank is, but it's not shining quite as brightly off them, is it? It's not highlighting them quite as brightly. There's none of these almost sheer white highlights going on on them, which is a way that you can have the characters be lit in different ways, but still occupy exactly the same scene and the same lighting conditions and use that for the composition. And I think that's quite good. Um, I also like that the orange is so highly contrasted, like, like having the orange here is clearly an important part of the character, and they want to be sure that it's one of the first things that you see when you really look at Gangplank is this bright glowing orange that he's taken a bite out of without even peeling it. The madman. This is a dangerous man who must be respected because he doesn't peel his oranges before he eats them. <laughs> Which is lovely. Um, anything else? Well, I mean, this is just a really gorgeous illustration generally. What I if you're um if you're a digital painter and you're working on your craft, you're, like you're trying to figure out how, how to get into digital painting, one thing to take a look at is the way that effort is concentrated in all of these splash art, because these are brilliant and like impressive, and this looks like a gorgeous, huge ship, and look at all that detail in the rigging and stuff, but if you take this image and you really zoom in on stuff like the roof back here, or the crow's nest, or the ropes, or even the rigging back here, all of these things that look from a distance like really impressive detail, when you zoom in on it, what you see is that it's just smears. Like, it's really rough painting. It's very smeary. It's not a lot of detail. It's not like a lot of time has been spent on getting all the texturing right. No, no. It's like you use a flat paintbrush and you just smear that shit on there because you are using these compositional techniques to draw people's eyes to the characters and to this stuff right here. You spend all of your time detailing that, like all of the little flecks and like the, 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 um, iridescent, the iron? What the hell is that called in English? Um, but the the green detail on Gangplank's brass shoulder plate and his his boots and the little scuffs of dirt and stuff. And out uh, here on the side, it's like stuff that's not that important, but it's just kind of nice to have. Just, just paint that, smear that on there. It's not that important to get all of it right. And that's once you start looking for those kinds of details, you'll see that everywhere in modern concept art in gaming is like artists know that. Like, I don't need to spend two and a half hours filling out all the details out here. It doesn't matter. It's a waste of time and effort. We focus our effort where it matters, and then we kind of phase out the details as we get further and further away from anything that's interesting to look at. Almost like an LOD um, in real life. <laughs> um, and that's an important discipline to learn if you're going into art uh, in in well, any, any commercial industry is to know where to put your effort, like to put your effort where it can make an impact. And like, if you can just fudge the rest of it, it's fine. Like, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Anyway, here we have a much more obvious and explicit framing. The railing, the rope, the sail, the rope. We have this perfect little trapezoid frame around the upgraded gangplank, leveled up gangplank, creating... Like, again, this space of interest, this is where our eye is immediately drawn. Looking at him right here, where he's supposed to be, and then everything else out on the sides, there's, like, it's nice it's there, it's nice it's detailed, but here is where our attention is drawn. And this is an interesting way to create power and malice in a character, because look at the difference between the two pictures. Here... Gangplank is powerful because, again, he's towering above us, he's looking down at, like, we have the perspective of the aristocrat who's hanging off the railing, basically. 
He is powerful because we're looking up at him. He's surrounded by his powerful crew and his big ship with a big mast. Like, this is why he's powerful, all of this stuff that frames him. Here, it's a very different feeling. There's no crew to back him up. There's no one helping him. He doesn't have a grand, imposing mountain of a ship in the background. You are not below his eye level. He's staring you straight in the eye, like he's looking you right in the face. The reason why he's fucking terrifying is because you see what's behind him, and that's... Oh, that's a lot of... That's a lot of barrels of... Uh-oh, those barrels have fuses on them. Oh, dear. This is a man who's like, yeah, I have 12 tons of dynamite right behind me, and it might go off in a second, and I don't give a fuck, because cool guys don't look at explosions. And that's what makes him menacing and powerful and dangerous here. Not that he's surrounded by all the trappings and fineries of a pirate lord, but because here is a man who is willing to go to that length, who is willing to do that if it gets him something that he wants. Which is the storytelling of the image, like barrels and barrels of gunpowder and Gangplank looking at you in no uncertain terms and saying, Do you want to go down with a ship, lad? Which is very, like, in terms of visual storytelling, is very, very effective to me. Like, make him terrifying just as a person on his own, rather than as a pirate lord. That works like gangbusters. I also like um, the use of explosions here in the background to kind of create this almost like you're in hell. It's like you're sailing on a ship in a lake of fire in the depths of hell itself with Gangplank as your captain right there. As, as visual storytelling goes, really very good. Let's see, there's the powder keg. Um, not a lot to say about it, except that, again, highlight with sunlight, basically, but contrasted against these dark, stormy skies to uh, underscore the menace and danger of what he's about to do. Gangplank's sigil on the um, on the barrel itself, but Misfortune's symbol on the sails of the ship that these barrels are clearly trying to torpedo. And which I think is like, it's a nice little composition, but most of the composition is just kind of taken up by water. This is something that Fizz's um, level two splash art avoided by having that very strong Dutch angle so that the water would only eat a corner of the image. Here, it's like more, no, this is about, these things are floating in the sea, so the ocean is allowed to take up pretty much half of the picture. Whew. So that's four cards, and we've been going for 40 minutes. So, it'll be a while, okay. Moving on to Nautilus. So, a lot of the same things going on that we've already talked about, using light to contrast him against a much more drab and dark background, but we're also dealing with a very different kind of environment here, where all of the previous characters we've been dealt with, all of them have been above water. Nautilus, on the other hand, is very much about the deep. Like, that's his whole... That's his storytelling. That's what he's about. That's what his deck is about, is to get to, to the state of the deep. And then all of your cards just get stupid powerful. I'm excited to try this out, by the way. Um, that's very much like the Nautilus thing. So you have to have a different mood set up here. And I feel like the darkness down here could be even more oppressive, honestly. Like, I feel like the background is maybe even too bright. Like, I feel like those tentacles and claws and God knows what else is popping out of the deep down here would have been f more frightening if it had been even darker and you could just barely see a hint of them. Like, you couldn't see them clearly, but you just kind of barely got a sense that there's something down here bigger than hammerhead sharks and great whites grasping up towards the surface. That's... It's also a matter of readability, though. Like, when you create art like this for a game like this, it has to be visible on all kinds of screens. Like, you have to be able to look at it on a phone screen, now that the game is coming out on mobile. You have to be able to look at it on my relatively high-quality BenQ monitors, and you have to be able to look at it at some shitty little, like, $20 monitor from some no-name brand off Amazon that doesn't have any color fidelity whatsoever. And so sometimes, you'll see uh, uh, artists trying to avoid too much darkness, because this is something Tom Scott did a video on recently, but basically the way that color is done on modern 16 and 32-bit monitors 
there's fewer colors available the darker a color gets and the absolute difference in in luminosity and uh and and lighting becomes way more obvious so if you go too dark with your colors you can see some really ugly color banding um that can be kind of hard to compress your way around when you compress images for viewing on multiple devices and and, and screens and that's also part of the discipline of creating art for video games and for digital media is to know that sometimes you have to sacrifice a good compositional idea for the sake of clarity, um, which I think is maybe part of what's happening here because I'm seeing a lot of color banding going on, actually, especially out here on the tentacles, which tells me that this picture was probably darker previously, and then they had to brighten it because it wasn't readable on all the devices they wanted to read it on. That's possible. Um, it could be that it was just designed like this, but I can see some really strong color banding in the compression here, so... I think that might be the case, actually. Right, scale. Here's another thing. Another way to make a character seem powerful and dangerous is to make them big. Just to make them large in relationship to their environment. Look at Nautilus next to this shark that's swimming in front of him. See, because the shark's in the background here. It's like, oh yeah, but maybe they're just far away, right? But no, this one's swimming there, like, in front of his anchor. And so it becomes clear that, oh, motherfucker, this man is a literal walking mountain. This is like a hundred brick shithouses got together, had an orgy, and the baby that came out was that. And I think if another shark had kind of swum in front of him, that might have strengthened that impression a little bit. But as it is, it kind of works really well that, oh, yeah, it's just a normal-sized guy in a, in a diving suit. Hang on, wait, what's that? Oh, no. Oh, no, he's large. <laughs> But yeah, here's, here's a, by the way, one of the first pictures we've had without a Dutch angle. Look at that, the horizon line is flat below down here, which has been rare um, so far. Oh, and again, color contrast. Nautilus's yellow eyes contrast nicely with, like, the green that's animating him in his suit. Um, and contrast nicely with the dark environment, which again draws your eyes to this space right here because the lighting is there to draw your eye. And here again, scale. That's a ship. That's a ship's mast coming out of the water right there. So when that guy rises above the waves, shaking hands with what seems to be a pretty decent-sized octopus, all things considered, he looks large. He looks like a big boy. He looks like a ton of everything. So, framing again, here's something interesting going on. Nautilus is so big, uh, essentially, here that he kind of creates a frame for himself a little bit. Like, look at the shape of, of like, the anchor and the arms, all kind of pointing into this bulging wedge shape, which also helps, helps emphasize the idea that he's rising out of the ocean. This is where I really wish I could draw with a highlighter over top of the things, but, like, imagine a shape like that if you kind of drew a line loosely around the outside of his body, you'd get this wet shape that pushes upwards, almost like something, like when something is breaking through the surface of the water, you know how you get that, like that bulge in the water as something like is ready to get to burst out of it? He's kind of emulating that. Like imagine, for example, if he had had his arms raised or his arms out wide, or if he had a different pose, then you would get a very different feeling. But here it, it feels a lot more like, oh, this thing has just burst out of the water and now everyone is fucked. Like, you have reached the deep, and now Nautilus is coming for you. And that's like a very effective little bit of compositional, where it's like, you don't need anything else to frame him. He's just big enough that you can't look at anything else. I love the details on the anchor, by the way. His anchor is really cool. Who made that rope, by the way? Like, who made a rope that was that big? Someone had to make that. <laughs> like, the anchor I can kind of, yeah, maybe for a really big ship, but the rope. How do you weave that? Magic, I guess. Um, again, using lighting, like, again, the bright yellow light on Nautilus's eyes contrasts with the bluish nature of the background environment. The same thing goes for the green that animates his body in there. Um, creates a, a color contrast with the rest of the environment, which draws your attention and your eye. Dun, 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 dun. That was the champions of Bilgewater. And now let's uh, just say units so that we don't get the spells. So here... Crackshot Corsair, or as I like to call her, Captain Emily from Tre Treasure Planet when she was a child. Um, 
again, there is some simple framing going on here. You can see kind of how the, the sails and the rope creates this little room for her in the image for her to be in as she's hanging out on the rope up here. And by the way, Riot, what the fuck is the deal with Yordles? Like, are the Yordles like these tiny little invisible magic cryptids that nobody knows about? Or are they just like normal things that walk around everywhere and hang out with people? Because that's kind of what it seems in Legends of Runeterra is that they're just like, they just hang out with people. They're just there and everyone's fine with it. But in the lore, the Yordles are like, holy shit, was that a Yordle? That can't be true. Yordles aren't real. Heck if I know. Laurie Goulding, um, the, the, the editor, uh, the narrative editor-in-chief of League of Legends, did say on Twitter that the thing they're working with right now is the idea that if you if you are inclined to feel positively towards Yordles, then you can see them as they are. But if you are inclined to hate Yordles or you're afraid of magical things or magic or afraid of Yordles, then they have a ma an inbuilt natural magic defense that will make them appear to just be small humans or some other small creature that you'll go, oh, that's not a Yordle, so I'm not going to be shitty to it. Which, okay, but seriously, you have to clarify this at some point. Anyway, um, she's just kind of fun. There's not that much to say about her outside of the framing, I think. Like, you can see the lighting is being used again to highlight her, uh, as opposed to the powder monkey that's empowering her gun, I think. I do, I do have a complaint about, as I said, I'll have plenty of complaints. Um... I do have a complaint that her face is so human. Like, I feel like Yordles are animal creatures. Like, they're little furries, basically. And looking at someone like like uh, uh, Heimerdinger or Rumble, I feel like if you're going to make her face this fuzzy peach fur thing, then you should go harder on it. The sexual dimorphism thing with the Yordles is kind of kind of bugs me sometimes because it's so inconsistent. Anything else to talk about here? I like the colors. Like, I like that there's lots of pink and red and orange um, being used in the image here, like, to make the sails really stand out against um, against the blue of the sky. And also having the clouds be lit up so that it kind of looks like you're looking at her at sunset, basically. Creating some nice color contrasts in the image itself. And also kind of creates a visual affinity between the sails and the clouds, as though the sails themselves are like clouds on the horizon on a pirate ship. But just like... Interesting imagery. Not sure they do anything with it, but whatever. Then there's the minions. <laughs> League of Legends has minions now. We're all fucking doomed. They have minions. Um, so these guys are actually pretty cool. What was it they were called? Dreg Dredgers. So there's some, there's some, a couple of cool things going on with their character designs here. I really like that they don't have eyes... But the marine creatures that are attached um, to their heads have eyes. So this guy has, like, a thing that looks like some kind of... It looks like a pirate hat, but it also kind of looks like a squid attached to his head. And it's that's the thing that has the eye that pokes out. And the guy back here literally just has a normal squid on his head. And it's that's the thing that has eyes kind of screaming at things, and this guy has a fish. I think that's really cool. That That's a really cool way to create a little sea gremlin of some kind, whatever the hell these things are. They're not yordles, that's for sure. They're some kind of sea gremlin or whatever. But that's, that's a really nice way to give them this maritime creature design. Almost a little bit um, Pirates of the Caribbean, like the the pirates on Davy Jones's ship. Kind of the same, same idea of merging stuff that looks humanoid with stuff that looks decidedly more fishy. <laughs> Um, one thing I, I do want to criticize about this image is that it's not really clear on a first vi viewing that this guy is fishing. Like, he's got, a f he's got a fishing rod, he's pulling it back, he's having a great time, everyone else is terrified of whatever the hell he's just pulled out. Um, and then the fishing rod, like, bends, really, really bends in a cartoonish way into the frame. I feel like that's a little bit unclear. Like, I feel like you could probably have pulled the camera back a little bit and shown a bit more of the fishing rod to really make it clear that that's what he's doing. Because certainly when I look at him here, it's like, oh, it's a fishing... Oh, it's it's a fish... It's a fishing rod. Yeah, okay, I, I got it. Now it's a fishing rod. That's what it is. Um, which is a little bit of a pity because that that... It's more funny when you know that they are terrified of whatever this mad lad has just pulled up of the up out of the ocean. Um, this picture is by Alex Heath, by the way. I think that's the first illustrator who wasn't uh, Six More Vodka that we've seen so far. But I think Alex Heath, if I'm not mistaken, is one of the internal artists at Riot themselves. I think. 
because I know some of them are also like outside contractors who were brought in specifically to work on the game. And you can kind of see that there's, a, well, I, I don't know if you can see it, but I can see there's a little bit of a difference in his painting style compared to the art that's done by Six More Vodka. He's got a little bit more of a flat shaded cartoony style than they do in some in some ways, and a little bit more of an oil painty aesthetic going on on the skin of his characters than the rest of the pictures. Like, especially on the hat, you can see this oil painty kind of rough texture that comes out of it, almost as though he's been using like a special brush or something. Which makes it look a little bit different than, like, this stuff right here is, like, way cleaner. Six More Vodka's art tends to be much more uh, sharp in a lot of its definition. Anyway, that's a completely irrelevant uh, observation. So here we have our first little callback. I believe this guy is in Gangplank's artwork. Yeah, there he is. Ish. Is that the same guy? No, it's not. Well, it is. It has to be, but... I guess he... No, it's not. It's not the same guy. He doesn't have the same... Okay. Just similar tattoos. Oh, yeah. Here... There's not that much interesting stuff to talk about with a Jagged Butcher, I think. He's not a very interesting composition as such. Like, there's... They're using the mast and, like, the... The lines of the sails to kind of bound him in here so that he has a... A place to stand. He's a cool character design. Like, I like having fat characters in games that aren't just, like ridiculous comedy jokes or whatever, but which actually have some menace uh, to them. Because that's kind of disturbingly rare when you get right down to it. But outside of that, not a lot of interesting stuff to say about him. He's not really the center of any narrative in his image. He's just kind of holding this thing out and being, I'm a pirate! I have a hook! It's fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with it, but it is just one of those that's just like a card without a lot of super interesting stuff to comment on. On the other hand, though, someone asked me what my favorite card in the new Legends of Runeterra update is. There you go. There's my favorite card. He's the best one. I will not be taking any arguments. I will not be taking any questions. He's the best one. And if you disagree, you're wrong. And I'm going to prove it to you. Evidence number one, he's a Poro. I, if you want more evidence, then you're wrong. Anyway. <laughs> uh, the Plunder Poro. His picture's been on the bounty board longer than most, for he's a greedy, ruthless devil that won't let anyone or anything stand in his way. Worst of all, he's... He's cute, damn it. Gangplank. <laughs> so, um... A little bit of um, Easter eggs in the background. We've got a wanted poster for Graves here, I believe. We've got one, I think, for Misfortune over here. And then we have the coolest, most badass one of all, which is for Pirate Poro, Plunder Poro, hanging right behind him. Because po Plunder Poro gives no fucks. Plunder Poro is not afraid of bounty hunters. Plunder Poro will take your shit down if you come for him. He will sit in front of his own wanted poster on a pile of gold. And if you try to fuck with him, Plunder Poro will fuck you right back. Because Plunder Poro is the biggest badass in Bilgewater. Gangplank steers clear. Ah... Uh. He's so good. I I just love the idea of having a Poro who's so big and fluffy that, <laughs> that he, it turns into a big pirate beard. <laughs> He's adorable. So a little bit of framing and, and composition going on here. He's sitting on top of this chest right here. And so all of this stuff right here, that becomes part of his foreground. And everything else becomes background to that which is what helps him stand out in the middle of the picture, along with the stuff we already talked about, like the sunlight on his gun and his hat, highlighting him, making him clearly the center of the image, the shadow um, falling, relatively speaking, on the rest of the image, and just the fact that he's surrounded by evidence of his power and wealth and general badassery in the shape of money, in this case, and treasure chests and a wanted poster that he's sitting right in front of because fuck you, that's why. Plunder Poro is good. I don't know if I'm going to make a Bilgewater, um, Bilgewater, uh, Freljord deck specifically for him, but I fucking might. <laughs> I need to drink something. Okay, moving on. I'm a little disappointed just a little bit, that they didn't take the obvious opportunity when they have a card called Pool Shark 
to have the guy literally be a shark. Like, there's fish people in, in Bilgewater, clearly. So why not have a shark man be the pool shark? That would be funny. That would be a pun. This is why Riot should hire me. Um, because <laughs> I'm smart. Um, so, pool shark. Once again, you can see the framing in this image is extra extraordinarily clear. We have this arc right here, and inside this arc is bright light and like this this golden light framing the character, highlighting him all along the sides. He's saturated. He's dressed in purple, where everything else t is like mostly grays and browns and kind of dull colors. Which again, the color helps draw our eye to him and highlight him along with the framing device of the thing around him. And by the way, smug motherfucker, isn't he? And then the only other thing that sort of draws our eye and our attention is the brightly colored orange ball and the uh, velvet of the pool board where he's playing with his tail, I guess, as a flex. Which, again, like, in terms of the visual storytelling, oh yeah, this guy, he's, he's looking down on you, literally, because we're looking up at him from below. He's got a confident smile on his face, he's got a power pose. He's knocking these things around, so the visual storytelling of, oh, this guy's good at pool, and he's gonna beat you at pool, is very present here. I also I also do like that, like, that's one of the things that Legends of Runeterra has done so well, is that it has expanded the bestiary of League of Legends. For there was a long time there where League of Legends felt mostly like it was like, human, 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 void monster, human, 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 undead, human, 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 undead, human, 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 some furries down in Shiriman, that was kind of it. Um, with, like, with the Vestaya introduced, they added a lot to the best story, but Legends of Runeterra has really done a lot to make Runeterra itself feel much more like a fantasy world, rather than just, like, a place with a bunch of humans in, in, like, Middle Ages cosplay running around. So, the pirate cutthroat. Or the prowling cutthroat, rather. Let's start with framing. First, we have her victim. Um, he is down here. He is... Remember how we talked about with Twisted Fate, how if you box a character in, um, if, if, you, if you squeeze them in the image, then you can create a feeling of being pressured or of being unable to escape from something. That's what's going on here. The victim of this um, uh, prowling cut, cutthroat is down here. He's boxed in under the sail, between the barrels and the railing and the ropes here, this creates this tiny little space for him to occupy, um, where he feels trapped in. And even if you expand it out here, he just has this tiny little sliver of nothing, um, which creates this tiny claustrophobic little space for him, which makes him look vulnerable. It makes him look like he is not in control of what's happening in the situation. Contrast that with our prowling cutthroat is like she can't be here because that's his space and she's trying to remain unseen but she has like all of even if you make the let the barrels be a barrier she has all of this oh hang on all of this all to herself and she fills that space completely up she's not encroached on by anything she has the space to herself in a different way which again makes her look powerful and him look helpless and soon to be dead now that thigh gap though I don't... This is kind of a misfortune situation again, where it's like, I'm sitting here going, no, hang on, wait, that... Where's her ass? Like, if her legs are that far apart... Wh how, how? Wait, no, that doesn't... So this is not, like, correct anatomy at all. It's a stylization again. And one that I feel like... Again, to me, this looks uncanny. Like, this looks too much. Like... You know most people's thighs touch, right? Like, that's normal. Nor like, even people who are very thin and skinny, a, a lot of their thighs still touch, because it's they're supposed to. It's kind of... It's a little bit too much for me, but if your mileage may vary... I do like the rest of her. Like, like I really like her pose. I like the whole, like, the, the arm coming up with the knife getting ready to strike and her looking over. Like, that's a really cool dynamic pose with the things... Like, with, with the arc of one knife here and there, it makes her look dangerous. It makes her look coiled and poised and ready to spring. Um, I like the lighting on her face a lot, actually. I like the little, like, the shininess on her face and her nose, as though she's either sweating or as though it's just a cold, dark night with lots of, like, dew in the air. It's, it has this, this glisten, this gleam that makes her seem... More present, more physical, more human, but also dangerous somehow? I don't know. It's probably combined with the pose and the blood red of, of the uh, 
bandana she's wearing. She looks dangerous. Like, she has a little bit of that Rob Liefeld thing with pouches for no reason. Um, but it's like, it's okay. It's fine. I, do, I also like the use of, of like, uh, the lighting. Like, you have the light of the lantern here, right? So the lantern is lighting up this whole wall back here. It's lighting up the whole space around the guy. But the light never reaches her. It's being blocked. She's hidden from his light. Which means that, like, he can't see her. And again, visual storytelling being used very efficiently. And then there's these kids. This is from Kudos Productions, which is another one of the studios that have been working on the uh, expansion to Legends of Runeterra. And then there's these kids. And they're just, they're just delightful. Look at these adorable little things. They've got a bubble cannon. That's cute. Shell Shocker. What does that thing even do? Oh, it has a tune. That's about it. Okay. My greatest strength is probably my command with the common people! And also, apparently, my spelling is really good, too. <laughs> I just... This is just lovely and kind of inventive. It's interesting how there's very different art styles in Bilgewater. Like, on the one hand, you have all of, like, this stuff. All this dark, dank people with powder kegs in the middle of the night and, like, gritty and edgy and dangerous and raw. And then on the other hand, you have stuff like... This, where it's just like, cartoon funland in the pirate world! Like, basically fucking Kingdom Hearts up in here, with how lighthearted and cutesy it is. It is. But I guess, like, Bilgewater embodies both things. Both pirate drama with lords and murder and, and assassination and stuff like that, and adorable little turtle children playing in the surf with their bubble guns. Um, so color here. Very different than everything else pretty much in Bilgewater so far. These colors are extremely bright and light. There's no sense of that heavy, like, wooden um, weight to it that you see in a lot of other places. There is really very little shadow going on anywhere in this image, um, which gives this very, a very bright, cheerful feeling, which, serve, which works very well with the character designs because these guys are fucking adorable. They're so cute. Look at them. Um, which I like. Like, I like that there's that diversity. I'm just kind of surprised by it because it didn't seem like something Riot were especially going for. So, composition. You can see here again, we're dealing with a slightly Dutch angle. Not that much, actually, but there's a slightly Dutch angle going on being kind of created by the splash and this, this curve of the waves, which I just find really aesthetically appealing somehow, like to have this S-curve just kind of cutting through the image of the surf. Um, and... The characters here, there's not so much of a frame highlighting them as such. Like, you can kind of see that they're they're being framed a little bit by the water and, and the tree. But mostly, they're just in focus because they take up the majority of the space in the image. Like, they're the biggest thing here. They're the obvious thing to look at. Man, those water effects are rendered nicely. Like, just look at all... Look at the curve of that. Like, something that's deceptively hard about rendering water like this, like, uh, and drawing it and making it look like it's really liquid that's being, like, burst around and flying fast, is, like, if you get this even a little bit wrong, the gravity doesn't look right. Like, it doesn't look like it's really flying around. It doesn't look like it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. But look at all the cur little curves and bends and twists that the artist has thrown in here. All those little things that give this feeling of this big wet glob of magic water that's being launched out of whatever the hell this is. Some kind of Nautilus shell launcher. And that's really difficult. Like, it's a small thing, but all of that stuff right there, that's fucking difficult to render correctly. Like, this little plume of water that kind of snakes around and then goes into the main... That's nice. Um, oh yeah, crabs and chat, by the way. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you, chat. Um, let's see. Anything else to talk about? No. I mean, much of the same stuff we've talked about already. Light being used to highlight the most important characters, and then this character kind of hazy and kind of out of focus compared to them a little bit more in the background. And Crab. But that's a good card. I like that. That's delightful. And then, like, right back to the other Bilgewater aesthetic where everything is, like, dark and heavy and like there's shadows everywhere and everything's kind of wooden and built and everything seems like it's almost collapsing rah, rah, rah. do youtube still take down accounts doing emote spam i don't think so uh to the best of my knowledge youtube has eased off on that a little bit um but like maybe be careful not to do it too much let's see was there a thing i missed of course it's poro yes Syndra. of course it's poro sorry for missing that one when it came up 
Anyway, Mr. Krabs has really fallen on hard times, hasn't he? He's a pack mule for some random dude in Bilgewater now. I used to own a restaurant. <laughs> SpongeBob, me lad. I can't do his voice. Um, so here we have a creature that looks a lot like a smaller version of Tom Kench, I feel like, um, which raises some questions for me. I think the idea of Tom Kench is, as a demon, he took on the shape of things that lurk in Bilgewater. Like, he, he's taking on a shape that's appropriate for his environment. He likes to hang out in Bilgewater, so he took on the shape of one of these creatures and kind of... And that's why he looks like that, and this is not necessarily a demon, but it's just... Tom Kench is mimicking the same species. I think that's that's the explanation that they're going with. Anyway, bunch of interesting little Easter eggs hanging out on this thing. We've got the uh, locket of the Iron Solari. We've got the old, um, what's the pendant that used to be used for the support quest for Shurima. Uh, but that thing, that that thing you had to did passive gold generation for uh, supports way back when. We have a mask that's not Jin's mask, I don't believe, but we have Shaco's mask hanging out up here, being all... Uh, why so serious about it? We've got a health potion, some more health potions. I think there's a Morellinomicon up here. And stuff like, like lots of little Easter eggs. And of course, um, and uh, it's not a needlessly large rod. It's a, um, it's the magic pen um, thing. Is that, it's not called magic pen anymore. Uh, it's, it's the, it's the, that thing. You know which one it is. Oh, and a dusk blade. Yes, good point, chat. Good catch. Anyway, lots of Easter eggs here, which is all very fun. Again, framing, um, it's not as explicit, but you can see, like, the barrel is on here with this very good little boy sitting there. I love, I love rats. They're so cute. And then the barrel is over on the side here, and the character that we're supposed to focus on highlight with um, bright light, basically. Now, we've talked about Dutch angles a lot, and this is a picture that's, like, very Dutch angle, like, very... Like, really, really tilty in its construction. And this is one of those pictures where I feel like that doesn't really do anything for it. Like, it's not really necessary. Like I said, a Dutch angle is usually employed um, to create a feeling of instability, to create a feeling of, of chaos or movement or dynamism. That's also how it's used in movies, by the way. Notice that when you're watching a film, when the camera tilts, it's because they want you to feel off balance. If the director is good and they know what they're doing. Don't watch Battlefield Earth. Um, but here, like, this isn't really a scene that needs that very much. Like, it's a it, this thing is a trader. It's a black market merchant that's trying to scam you, basically, uh, is sort of the characterization of the, of the character. But the Dutch angle here, I feel like it's mostly there because the artist wanted a way to fit in, like, the tall load on the back in, on the back of the crab mule thing that's carrying the things like so that they could get all this stuff in here and that was easier if you tilted the image down because then you have like a, a taller space to paint into but in terms of of the feeling the mood of the composition i don't feel like the dutch angle does very much for it right here very effective use of light though because again you still have the feeling that this is like like this dank dripping underground black market cave place like, full of shady characters and dark shadows and dripping water and just kind of damp and unpleasant. And still, the bright natural light that falls on our main character doesn't alter that mood. Like, it doesn't make it feel less dank and oppressive. It just highlights the character. And that can also be kind of difficult to do, um, to do that right. Again, Kudos Productions. You can kind of see, if you look at Shell Shockers also, which is also a Kudos Productions image, you can see that they have a style in the studio. Like, you can you can kind of see that same approach to color. Because even here, where we're not, like, in the brightest sunlight above the water, uh, but we're down under the water among the corals, where things are a little bit more shadowed, you can still see that light pastel color approach to the composition of the scene that gives it the same mood, um... As, as the shell shockers had, like you have kind of that same color mood, where it kind of looks like a, 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 a promotional art for a kids' cartoon or something along those lines, with like coral kids Thursdays at eight, that kind of thing, which works very well because again they're illustrating some very cutesy little creatures, these little uh, coral creatures, which are hanging out down here, and the coral creatures seem to have gotten their hands on. You see that it's a water bubble thing with magic, like. Uh, pinkish purplish magic 
coursing inside it, they seem to have gotten themselves at, uh, their hands on something that's very similar to this. So there's a continuity between the two images where, okay, so this is this is a special kind of water magic that just kind of exists here. And which this, these creatures are curious about. And also, like we talked about on the Gangplank image, if you look at the creatures out here along the edges of the image and you zoom in on them, you can see that the painting out here is way sloppier than the painting in here among the focus of the image. Because again, doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't need to be detailed out here. Here it just needs to be functional, but here it needs to be detailed and very, like, highly rendered. Which, again, always look at that if you're a concept artist. Always take notice of how other concept artists choose to spend their effort. Because you only ever have so much time to complete a piece. Like, there's always a time limit. There's always, like, a budget limit where you have to complete X number of pieces in X, X amount of time. And so, like, pacing yourself is is a really important lesson of looking closely at concept art and, and game art, is to just notice how much effort isn't used, how much extra effort isn't spent, because it's not worth it. A thousand people now, good lord, hello! I'm always surprised when I do these streams that a thousand people want to listen to me ramble like this for several hours, because it's gonna be several hours. I hope you're all... I hope you all have drinks and food and... Pillows? I don't know. Nice thing to put your feet up on. I do like this character design on the creature. Like, I like that the coral on the head is simultaneously being used to kind of simulate hair or horns. And also that apparently they blow out these little bubble things. Which, I don't know, are they oxygen? Are they, are they responsible for putting oxygen into the world? Who knows? But there's a lot of interesting questions being asked about, like, what are these creatures like? What do they do? What are they about? I also like that you can identify each one of them. Like, you can see the pattern of red across the green is different for each one. So it's not that they just all have the same pattern. It's like a, a identifying feature on them, which is, in terms of character design, is very well made. Uh, is, is a very good little detail to have. When you have a race of creatures like this that are all kind of similar otherwise, even if you can do different stuff with, like, the number of, ten of, of uh, coral things on their head, Little things like that, of, of like finding a way to create individuality between characters, um, is is really good character design, in my opinion. Okay, moving on to the Dreadway Deckhand, who also summons powder kegs, because of course. So this is one that's created by an individual illustrator. This is Daole, um, who I think is a freelancer who works for Riot. I don't, to the best... Man, I looked this up before we started, but now I've forgotten. I can't remember, but I think this is a freelancer. I don't think this is a writer. I think it's a freelancer. Um, and again, you can see a very different style, um, especially in the face of this character, than in a lot of the other art in Bilgewater. Like, mostly the, the environment rendering um, and, like, the clothes and stuff are very much the same as the rest of, of the card art, but the face especially, and, like, the, the character design sensibility, the way the hair is rendered, is noticeably different um, than the rest of the characters in Built Water. I think there was a thing. Oh, Mr. Mine HD. I must say, tattoo artists must make a really good living in Built Water. There seem to be only full body tattoos. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's lucrative. I think you make a lot of money being a tattoo artist in Built Water. Um, so there's a little bit of a, of a difference in style there, um, which is this seems more anime inspired. Um, in terms of the way the, like, the stylization of the face than a lot of the other characters, which your mileage may vary on that one. Anyway, framing, same thing again. You have these two um, parallel lines running across here that creates a framing of the character. The light of the torch is being used to draw your eyes specifically to the character, which also warms up their colors relative to the coldness of the rest of the environment. And then, in addition to that, you've got moonlight, or at least it looks like moonlight, coming down from up here, highlighting the character's character on the other side, which emphasizes the environment that they're in. Also, this is clearly like someone who's sneaking, um, I, we could fight them at dawn when their crew is awake and their cannons are primed, or we could leave them a gift tonight, nice and quiet-like. And that's very much emphasized by, like, they're constrained between these two narrow slits of the ship, but it also gives them a certain momentum, like it gives them a movement, as though they're sneaking under the cover of night, um, and 
to do a thing. And you can kind of see that in her posture as well. Like this, she's kind of low with the shoulders up and kind of hunched over forwards, like being careful looking around. Um, so the environmental storytelling, the visual storytelling here is actually pretty good. Now, I'm not sure I like the anatomy on that arm. Because, like, I think her elbow is supposed to be here. And then it goes out into the hand, but the glove kind of obscures where her elbow is, which makes this arm look too long, as though the elbow would be out here. And then a very, very short arm. The foreshortening is kind of... I think the foreshortening is a little bit messed up, um, but that's just a personal opinion. She also has a waist, as people are pointing out in chat, that as well. Um, that much more than misfortune does, which I appreciate, is that she looks like she could have internal organs and have room for them. Which is nice, like, that's that's a good thing to have as a person. Speaking of wastes, oh boy, there it is again. Um, like I said, this is sort of a thing I have about Six More Vodka, is like, very, very thin lady, very, very thin lady, huge, giant, buff man dude, very, very thin lady, very, very thin lady. Like, it's a thing. It's a thing that happens. So, this is the bounty board, and we've been here before. In fact, we have seen some of these posters, uh, I think, before, because this is the bounty board that um, the Poro... Uh, plunderer was sitting in front of. I think he was perhaps on the other side of it, but it's the same bounty board, which I think is a nice detail that that kind of um, reoccurs across various bits. Lots of Easter eggs in the background here. I think Garen is on a wanted poster here, or maybe Darius. It's hard to tell because they look so goddamn similar in their face construction. This looks a lot like Braum for some reason. <laughs> Probably isn't. Um, we've got the Minotaur Reckoner, if you remember him from Noxus, he's out here. We've got what looks like Kled out here, which is ultimately not surprising whatsoever. And maybe a Lowy? I don't know, I don't think so, actually. But yeah, I'm sure there's a million Easter eggs for people to look at here. Uh, I don't think I can catch them all. But she's taken one down, like she's a... She's a hired gun, she's off doing a bounty, and again, the visual storytelling is pretty strong, that she's just taken a bounty from the board, she's off with her big gun to go and hunt the bounty and do the thing. So, not a lot of framing here. Like, you don't have that explicit frame with, like, things that are creating a specific space for her, so the framing is done instead with light. Because you have this shaft of sunlight that bursts down here, and then it's bounded up by these characters in the foreground who are much more in shadow, while she is brightly out in the light, highlit, especially on her face, drawing your attention to her as the center of the image, which again, since the composition needs her to be easily centered in like this vertical slice of a card art is just like what the composition demands. And because she's completely centered in the image as well, that also helps draw your eye straight to her. Lots of interesting characters in the backgrounds, though. Like, I like, um, I like this big fish guy. He's cool. Like, I think he's a, he's a cool character. I think he shows up somewhere else, if I remember correctly. I may be wrong about that. We'll see. I like this guy. Like, I like that he has a little hat with feathers on it and, like, a revolver. <laughs> Instead of the giant Pilto, uh, Biltwater cannons, he's got, like, a tiny little revolver thing going on. Much more of a cowboy vibe mixed with a Renaissance fair reenactor, which I think is kind of cool. Then there's these boyfriends back here, and they are boyfriends. I mean, look at them. Clearly, they are boyfriends. <laughs> and there's the Proro Plunderer, by the way. And there's like there's lots of contrast and interesting character designs in the background. And then we have Large Lad, Big Boy, Chunky Fella, the Bubble Bear, and he seems to be eating. You know, those um, bubble things that the shell shockers were shooting and that the coral creatures were looking at, he seems to be quite fond of consuming those. Um, so they are some kind of recurring thing across a lot of the cards, which I wonder if there's lore behind that. I wonder if there's something behind it in terms of uh, build water lore. Is it some kind of resource? Is it something people farm or is it just sea creatures eat this stuff? Is it just magical energy? I don't know. So his character design is based partly on an axolotl. Like you've got these little um, fuzzy tentacle things, which if I remember my biology correctly, axolotls use those to breathe by filtering oxygen out of the water through them, like with these wide um, tendrils that catch a lot of water and can therefore extract a lot of oxygen for them. It helps them breathe. Um, and I think that's kind of a cool thing to bring in here because axolotls are more typically associated with freshwater and rivers. 
than being associated with um, with seawater. But it's kind of cool to see it brought in here. It's Swampert! Yeah. <laughs> I think it's tied to the mechanic that refills spell mana. That's a good point, actually. Do all of them have attunement? That one has a tune. Yeah, they all have a tune. Hey, good catch. That's a great catch. Nicely done, Patrick. That's a very good catch. So those things are tied to attunement, probably, because they've been in all the art that uh, of of uh, creatures that have a, that have attunement. Nice. That makes sense. I like his uh, I like his big fat body. I like, again, like I said, having characters in game art who are fat without being a punchline. Or without, like, the fatness being like, oh, look at this disgusting, ugly slob, ew. That's kind of rare, which is a bit of a pity. Uh, because, like, there's so much more you can do with a large body than just, oh, it's evil or gross or whatever. Um, and that's so overdone. So this is more interesting to me that it's, like, neutrally framed. That he's just a large lad who likes eating. And he has these terrifying claw hands also. Like, lies soft and round and soft and round and spiky, 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 spiky. Which I think is a cool little bit of character design contrast, is that his form is apparently... Like, it looks to me like he can alter his form, his shape. Like, he can turn his hands into claws when he wants to, in order to grab these little bubbles of magical energy and, and snack on them. Um, and that's just, like, a nice little little bit of character design contrast. Anyway, framing the, the shell, the clam shell that he's sitting under is doing the work of framing him. As you can see, the background of the environment is mostly like the same shades of blues and purples and greens and stuff that kind of inform his character design. So if he was just framed against this as a backdrop, he would kind of fade out into it. Like he would, there wouldn't be a strong contrast between the character and the backdrop. So the seashell gives you this neutral, flat, dark background against which his big bubbly body can be highlit with the light coming down from above and act as much more of a contrast, which I think is very nicely done. I also, like, the rendering on here is really good. Like, you really get a good s sense of his three-dimensionality, which can be very hard to do. Like, rendering uh, rendering things to look this shapely is hard work, I gotta tell you. Then we have a Golden Narwhal, um, which is, seems like a weird card to me, because it's a 2-4 for 3, and it's elusive, but it's also vulnerable, like, by default. Which, I don't know if probably some etch case use for that somewhere, but I'm not sure if I would use it. So, why is this narwhal being hunted? Well, you can tell, because it's got gold on it. Legends say a pale horned whale once stole from the bearded lady as punishment, the lady covered the greedy creature in glittering gold so it would forever tempt the avarice of others. Um... Which I think works really well. Like, it's it's a cool character design. It's something that looks... It looks recognizably enough like a, like a whale, like a, a real sea creature, but it has this monster hunter-looking golden horn thing going on on it that creates a really distinct, unique character design. Because the one thing is, like, um, when you think of Nautilus, for example... Like, he's surrounded by normal ash sharks. Like, these are just normal sharks. This is a hammerhead. This is like a tiger shark or a sand shark of some kind. Great white sharks out here. Normal ash sharks are down here with Nautilus, which is like, okay, that's a little weird for a magical world like League of Legends. Um, so here we have a, a sea creature that is much more decisively uh, alien-ish looking. And good lord is the poor creature being hunted relentlessly. You can see harpoons being shot into the water. You can see a giant net being, like, um, raised below it in order to catch it and drag it up. You can see all these pursuit ships just chasing the poor thing down. I kind of feel bad for it, honestly. Um, but also, I think the color here is kind of self-evident, almost. Like, you have the dark of the sea in the background, then you have this bright, golden, shining light completely dominating uh, like your impression of this space of the image and you can see that they're also using that in the card art itself where it's like yeah the golden horn is the thing like that's the thing that frames this character as interesting and unique and so that's what you get compositionally not a lot else to talk about like it's just it's kind of its own um, attention grabber and you, you do get a good sense of speed I think from this image like from from the curving of the whale's body to like the deepened, uh, the deepened perspective of the space and the harpoons flying by, as well as this, these little beard hairs that kind of 
um, give you a sense that it's just, it's swerving, basically swerving to avoid the harpoons coming down. It's a nice little illustration, not remarkable as such, but nice. So here we have a girl who I'm pretty sure I saw her on Gangplank's crew. Yeah, there she is. I'm reasonably sure that's the same girl. Or someone with a very similar aesthetic, at least. And, yeah, again, not a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. Like, you can see there's a there's a flat neutral, like, there's a fairly set of neutral colors in the background that highlights, like, the brightness of her upper body and the hairdo. You've got the harpoon poking into this space that's otherwise mostly bright white and kind of uh, neutral and pale giving you this this line that draws your eyes straight to her as a character. I like that they are willing to hide her face behind the harpoon gun itself. Um, that's something that, like, notice this when you look at a lot of artwork of characters that use guns or sniper rifles and stuff like that. Oftentimes, the artists are really unwilling to let the gun, like, be in front of the face and occlude it and, like, like take, take focus away from the face itself. Um, because, like, the face, like I've talked about before, is... The human eye is drawn to faces. It looks for faces. It wants to find them. So if you block it off, you kind of you remove a point of visual interest um, from your composition, which a lot of artists are not willing to do. Anyway, um, yeah, not a lot of interesting stuff to talk about here. I like the energy of the crowd. Like I like that she's clearly like Taskmaster, right? Like she once the, she fires the hooks, have to move fast. Blood in the water brings all manner of company and none of it is welcome. So she fires the starting gun, basically. The first shot at presumably, well, this poor little creature. Um, and once the blood is in the water, then the, cr the crew of hookmen, um, who are the people who are like grab onto the creature and either cut it to pieces or drag it aboard, have to, like, instantly burst out and jump into the water and get ready to carve this thing up before sea monsters are summoned by the smell of blood. Which, I like the energy of that. Like, there's a lot of frantic movement going on with the characters behind her. I also like um, the bright white sails and that's that are almost kind of fading out with the clouds themselves, which gives you this, this feeling of mistiness, almost. Which is a nice mood. It doesn't add very much, but it's a nice mood. So here's a good one. Remember how we talked about scale? Yeah. That's a big fish. That's a large sea serpent of some kind. Holy crap. This is like dune levels of big serpent snake. Uh, let me check. There's nothing came in. No, good. I really like this. I like, I like the sense of scale in this composition that these guys are very, very small and incredibly optimistic if they think <laughs> they're going to take on this thing. Um, and so a uh, color, by the way, not a lot of light here. Actually, this is one of the first images where we haven't seen light specifically being used to highlight characters here. The highlighting of these characters is in their color um, contrast from the rest of the image, because here you have all this white sea foam basically being dragged up onto the body of whatever the hell this is and that highlights that blood red that shock of blood red of the little sail that they've got going on there which, which instantly brings that into focus in contrast with like the mostly dark very neutral tones of this roiling sea and even the body of the sea monster itself which is mostly desaturated so this shock of color right here draws your eye and your attention to them in their tiny little boat as they Apparently feel that they have a shot. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, we've got them, boys. I wrestled hogs all day back on the farm. We can handle a big one. Are you sure about that, Bubba? Oh, yeah, damn sure. You just got a hacker till she wheezes, man. <laughs> I love the optimism. Poor dead bastards. Anyway, I need to have another drink, I think. So, the monkey idol. This one's a souvenir. Oh, this is misfortune. The crew nabbed it from a crazy old rival of mine. Turns out the fool's ramblings about ancient mysterious powers weren't too far from the truth. So, monkey idol. And this seems to be connected to the powder monkeys. Um, they seem to be either worshipping it or perhaps even spawned from it somehow. Because you can see the little, the little tails of dark kind of billowing out of the mouth of the thing. 
And we have, I think, one of Misfortune's guns lying right here. Um, and it seems to be holding one of Misfortune's giant musket bullets. So perhaps the monkey idol here is the thing that's generating the powder monkeys that Misfortune uses to fight. Not 100% sure. Anyway, framing, we've got the curtains and like the treasure box and the curtains on behind the window here, which has a very bright um, flat color. And then you have this big dark monkey idol with the glowing eyes in the middle, which all of it draws your attention there. And the framing does a great job of showing you exactly uh, where to look. And we know, by the way, that we're on Misfortune's ship because look at the lock down here, heart-shaped, which is the kind of thing that Misfortune uses as a symbol. Out of, other than that, I don't think there's a bunch of... Oh, heart shapes in the window, by the way, too. That's fun. I don't think there's a bunch of other interesting details here as such. It's a fairly static image because the monkey idol, of course, is not a character. I like the design. Like, I like that it has has these little bulging cheeks coming out in, in like, the construction of the thing, which makes it look cute. But then that terrifying, like, the mouth that looks like it's almost opened in a little squeaky howl or something makes it look kind of vaguely scary along with the big bright round eyes. Okay, super chat. Um, hey, TB Sky, just wanted to thank you for all the content you've made. Helps as I'm cleaning hospital rooms. Oh, shit, Draco. I salute you, man. Uh, lady, person. That's a tough job. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you have protective equipment. Because, damn, like, especially cleaning, that's an essential thing to do right now. So thank you very much. I, I kind of feel bad almost taking money. Um, thank you very much for that. And thank you for the work that you're doing. So the... Um, the monkey idol summons powder monkeys. Okay, that's clear from the mechanics. I should just have read the card. <laughs> then I would have known. And the powder monkeys themselves have a little bit of a splash art of their own. Now, there's something interesting going on with the painting of these little things. Or maybe that's just, nah, you know, I just I just think the artist isn't using too much effort out here. But I do like the design of these little things, like that their tails are a fuse, and that they seem to be glowing with light from the inside, not just through the eyes, but through their ears as well. I think that's a cool way to design them to look like they're a little burning thing that's almost... Um, that's almost blowing up all on its own. And they're cute. Like, this this is adorable. Like, it's kicking the, its friend in the face behind him because it's running off with one of Misfortune's bullets that it's got <laughs> and doesn't want to give up. The composition here is really strong, by the way. The rope that they're running on gives you this perfect line that kind of draws your eye to this monkey, to that monkey, to that monkey right there. Everything that you need can be found along this one line. So, so long as your eyes are, like, following that, which they will be because it's so prominent, you can draw their eyes to anything that you want so long as it's on the rope itself. Which I think is very well done. I like the little detail that the rope is almost burning in half here because of because they're setting light to it with every little step they take. They are adorable, aren't they? Another Yordle. And another obvious, um, I, another obvious use of all the same techniques we've talked about already. He's he's in light, completely lit up with sunlight. This guy's in shadow, even though he's further ahead in the foreground. And this is actually interesting. So there's lots of different techniques that you can use to create um, visual interest, to draw a person's eye. And. We've talked about how size is one thing that can really, like, dominate an image and really be used to draw people's eyes. What's interesting here is that this guy is way bigger in the frame. Like, he takes up almost half of the whole picture is just him. But he's not the point of interest at all because this guy has the framing and the light and the color doing the work of highlighting him instead. And you can see that happening, um, that like the barrel that he's standing on helps him literally stand out in the foreground, or rather in the middle ground, rather, of the things that are in the background. The very bright sunlight that's illuminating him and his spear and his uh, his bright white fur. The white fur is important too, by the way. If, if he had had brown fur, it would be a lot harder to pick him out behind uh, from the ship behind him. And like this, this uh, chocolate golden brown hair, all of that helps really single him out as the most important thing in the image, despite this guy being closer and bigger, which is like, 
that's good work from the artist is that they're able to do that. They're able to have a thing that's way bigger than the main subject and still have this be the main subject of the picture. I like that a lot. That's hard work. Isn't the guy in the back to the left the same guy in T uh, TF's art? This guy right here? Or one of the ones over here? I don't think so. Wait, the mouse disappeared? There we go. Should be back now. Um, but yeah, like here you can really see how powerful light and color can be in terms of drawing one character out instead of another. Um, and it's used very well here. And interestingly, there was probably an opportunity here to use the clear blue sky. Like if you twisted the camera like a few degrees to one side so that he was framed against the light of the, against the bright blue of the sky, you could probably have done that, but they didn't need to. You can spend much more time like showcasing the ship as well, just because this is so strong and clear, which I think is very well done, honestly. And then we have Slotbot, <laughs> who's a casino robot of some kind, or perhaps rather a demon. I'm not really sure what to make of that mouth right there. One prototype spun three bombs and then exploded. Later models had this feature removed. <laughs> so it is a robot then, I guess. With a very cool character design. Like, there's a couple of interesting things going on with Slotbot here because... And a couple of confusing things as well, because I can't really tell if he's supposed to be a robot or some kind of organic creature. Because of the of the head, like because of this right here looks like it's supposed to be an organic head, but then the rest of the body is robotic. I don't know. That's a that's a minor character design thing. It's not really important. I do like the hat um, because Slotbot here has this big, uh, or rather not big, this tiny black head um, on top of his body with these glowing eyes. Now, if that had been framed against, like, the glowing eyes especially, if they had been framed against the background, which is clearly very bright, they wouldn't stand out very much. So you have this giant sombrero-looking, almost mushroom-head-looking thing going on on him that creates, again, the kind of dark background that you need for glowing eyes to stand out. Um... Other interesting things? Not a lot. Like, I don't think there's a lot of Easter eggs anywhere in the image. Like, I think a lot of what's going on here is obvious in terms of the things we talked about already. He's very brightly colored. He's very saturated. Everything else is desaturated and much less brightly colored. He has the backlight that kind of highlights the entirety of him. The light falls on his golden or brass robot body and his pants, his hammer pants that he's wearing for some reason. He's got the bright purple cape that makes him stand out amongst the relatively drabber color environment that he's in. A perfectly effective little piece of art. Not interesting as such, but hmm. Then we have this lady, who like, now there's a character design with some distinction to it, isn't there? Oh, I need to blow my nose just a sec. I swear, every time I sit down to stream or record something, that's when my nose starts giving me trouble. I'm allergic to streaming, that's the problem. So there's a couple of interesting things going on here in terms of color. Um, things that I, I wouldn't have thought that they'd put in a place like Bilgewater, but this lady is like bright green and pink, which is like very distinctive and unusual. Like even her pants down here, even those less obvious are pink. And she's got this bright purple vest on. Which I think is... I'm not sure if I like it. Like, I'm, I'm kind of unsure of it. Because like, on the one hand, that's really fucking bold. And it's incredibly distinctive. Like, holy shit, she stands out among Bilgewater characters. And that works because she's a brash gambler. Like, she's someone whose, like, whole personality is... I have giant knuckle irons and I slide coins across a table with... Over a poster with t uh, Twisted Fate's name on it. She's brash. She is someone who's loud, who wants to create trouble who wants to be noticed so having the character look like almost like she's she's almost kind of like a, a character from like an 80s dystopian punk future futuristic punk uh scene or something like from a final fight game or streets of rage or something so on the one hand that works really well because she's kind of grounded in the bilgewater aesthetic by her tattoos um a little bit as well 
But then with the fedora and the pink card and that shock of pink permed hair, that's an interesting design. I'm not 100% sure if it works, but I'll never forget it. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, framing. Um, not a lot of framing going on here. Like the table does help cut off like half of the picture. And then you have like the bright light that backlights her, but doesn't backlight anyone else, which helps keep her main colors neutral while everyone else gets kind of washed out by the bright light coming in. That helps. It helps that she's in the center of the image. It helps that you have this arm um, that like shoves this pile of gold forward that kind of draws you into looking at her at the center of the image right here. I do like that she's apparently, either she's wagering against Twisted Fate or she's saying that she'll take him down or something along those lines. I'm not 100% sure what's going on there, but like between the nails and the knuckle irons and stuff like that, that's a distinctive character as hell, man. And she stands out a lot too, because like, look at everyone else in the room that she's in. They all look fucking boring compared to her. It's just like, I'm a man with a beard. I'm a man with a beard. I'm a man with a beard. <laughs> Yeah, very cool. And also, um, notice we have a Dutch angle here, but we also have something else going on. We have a very slight curvature to the table's edge here. And that's not because the artist couldn't draw a straight line. That's happening either because the table itself is round, which is probably it, but also it gives this subtle fisheye lens effect, almost as though the space is being distorted by a wide angle lens a little bit, um, which, which also helps open the space up a little bit and make the whole place seem bigger. That's Dao Lei again, the same person who did the uh, saboteur character. And you can kind of see that same anime influence a little bit stronger in the character's face here. But wow, look at those dreadlocks. Man, the rendering on those is great. Holy shit, every little strand of hair. Oh, that's really pretty. Nice, that's cool. Okay, not what we're talking about, though. Um, What she called Island Navigator. Uh, so she's a Nagakeboros, or a Buru, rather, probably. And you can kind of tell that from the design of her clothing and her and her face tattoos. And she has a waist! Like, look at that! She has room for organs! Isn't that amazing, ladies and gentlemen? There's, there's a person who looks like she might actually, like, be able to stand up in a stiff breeze. <laughs> I'll never let that go. Um, so a couple of interesting things going on here. She is, is, like, she's framed, like, there's a framing going on in terms of, like, the rope, the barrel, then the railing, then the rope, and then the sail, which creates, a, like, a little bit of a framing space for her, but also she frames herself a little bit by doing this thing where she draws water, magic, light stuff up and creates this kind of swoop around herself um, that creates, again, like we talked about with the powder monkeys, this line of interest that even if your eye isn't immediately caught by her, which it should be because she looks amazing, um, this line will inevitably guide you to her staff, which will uh, end to her, and you will have your eyes drawn to the character themselves. Um, like, whether whether you want it to or not. I'm curious about the magic, because most magic in Bilgewater, especially most magic that has to do with the water, tends to be identified with bright green. Like, that's Nautilus especially, but also, like, deep water magic of all kinds tends to be identified with bright green. We've seen bright gold magic before from the Buru people. That was in the Shadow Isles animated short that I took a look at when back when that came out. Um, and I wonder if this is kind of the same thing that, like, that's just what Buru magic specifically looks like, and it's only Ilawi who has Nagakeboro's magic that is that, like, that has that deep deep uh, green of the depths, whereas this is much more their style of magic. Curious about that in terms of the lore. But yeah, I like the little details that... So, if you take a look at the, the tattoos on other characters in Bilgewater, like the Brash Gambler, um, like or the dude in the background here, look at the shape language. You have these swooping curves and rounded... Um, and rounded shapes, kind of tribal tattooish, but like that are made to look like uh, the tentacles of um, of a squid of some kind. Now take a look at the tattoos on the island navigator instead, and all of a sudden you have this very strong angular design, rather instead, and that's something that's um, emblematic and identifying of the Buru people. Ilawi has them as well. You can see it also represented at the bottom of her coat here, like this angular, um, straight-line design 
that is characteristic of her people. And I like that you have this unified aesthetic in Bilgewater, where both the Buru and the pirates are all, they're all tattooed, all of them, all the time. Lots of body art going on. But the pirates have this, like, tentacle design, like these, these swooping, curvy, sharp, pointed lines. And then the Buru people have these stubbier, like, much more... Uh, much thicker, much more powerful line work that kind of makes them that makes them look like they come from the same place, but from two different cultural traditions in the same place. Which is like that's nice. That's a that's nice world building, in my opinion. Now here's a character. <laughs> so I think actually, I think in his hmm interesting. I think in the announcement trailer we had a different art. There was a different artwork for this guy's card. I think. I think it was different. Interesting. I wonder why that got changed. Anyway, here we have Mystifying Magician, um, the Marvelous Marvolio, I think he's called. Marvolio? Where, where, where are my hands? I will now make them appear. Ta-da! <clears throat> ta 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 da Where are my hands? Okay, time to go. Time to go. Thank you all of you so very much. <laughs> I like that. Oops, I, I made your hands disappear. <laughs> anyway, love this character. Look at this smarmy motherfucker. Like, yeah, that's what a Bilgewater stage magician would look like. Some, like, <laughs> Darren Brown-ass motherfucker scamming people out of their money and taking away their hands. Um, so, again, um, here the color contrast is different. So, remember how... Um, Fizz, in the very first card we looked at tonight, 10 million years ago, Fizz was highlighted by, might as well go back and look at him, by being much darker in tone than most of the environment that surrounds him, especially the sky, but also like the, the dust clouds and stuff like that. Same trick is being used here, um, where rather than Marvolio or the, where is he, or the mystifying magician being like explicitly highlighted by being brighter than everything else. Here, he's much darker almost than the rest of his environment, especially like with the um, with the characters here in the background. These characters are almost rendered in sapia tone, right? Like they're almost just all brown with, with no distinguishing colors to themselves. Whereas Marvolio has this huge shock of like this purple flowing cloak with the red, um, the red, um, Four. Uh, I'm looking for the English word. With the red on the other side, on the inside of it. Um, he's got this purple coat, and he's got this bright shock of blue tentacles coming out of his hat and all of that stuff. Um, that highlights him against the background of the image because he's contrasting with it, but not because he's highlight he's highlighted relative to it, but because he's well darker than it, essentially in his in his color contrast, which is sort of it's the same trick but just kind of in reverse which is, again, another useful compositional technique. And I like that a lot. Like, he's got this this uh, edge shape, this edge lighting coming from, from, the, from the thing itself, and I like his expression. Like, look at this smarmy bastard. Like, he looks so confident, and then you look at what he's actually doing, and it's like, hang on, this looks a little Cthulhu. This, this is a little disconcerting. That's not a card trick. What the hell? <laughs> so I kind of get the feeling of him as, like, someone who's toying with magic power is a little bit beyond his control, like that he doesn't quite understand as such. Um, but he's doing it with confidence anyway, because he's a grifter. And as people are pointing out in chat, oh boy, yeah, there's another narrow waist right there, holy shit. I didn't notice it at first because he has such a broad chest, but good lord, man, eat a meal. And I'm not sure you can, like, where would the poop even come out? You don't have an intestine. That is, again, it's a stylization. Uh, whether it works for you is, well, that's your mileage may vary, but I would like to see him have, like, room for spleens would be good. This is a little too much now that I've noticed it. Oh, I can't, oh, I can't look away from it. That's not great. And also, hmm, I feel like his pose would probably be stronger if instead of his leg going that way, it was more like he's... he's have some more of a power pose, like more of a ta-da. Oh, well, that's a minor thing, but yeah. Boy, howdy. That is not a lot of space for anything. Here, again, scale. Um, so, this is something that goes back uh, 
at least the, the place that I first learned about this was in Romantic era paintings. So the Romantics of the Romantic era were obsessed with the grandeur and romance of nature. Um, they, they had this obsession with like uh, with like a return to nature, with a return to the grandiosity and greatness of the Garden of Eden and the greatness of God's power as embodied in nature itself. Like a, a whole lot of wank. But this is why romantic poets would often write poems about, oh, nature, good and grand, beautiful trees, flowers, overwhelming you with sensations, like all of that shit. Um, but one of the things that's characteristic of romantic painting is that when they want to paint a landscape and give you a sense of how big and grand nature is, what they'll include in the image is like a ship, but it's tiny compared to the greatness of the ocean, or a person, but they're tiny compared to the m m majestic size of a mountain. Like that was that was basically a, a little visual trick that they used to showcase the scale of an image to kind of impart on the viewer that same sense of awe before the majesty of nature that they were so obsessed with. Anyway, that technique still exists to this day, and that's that's part of the art history of something like this in a video game, in a, in a card game that you play on your phone. Some of the artwork uses the same kinds of techniques that have been used in artwork for, well, hundreds and hundreds of years now, which I always thought is kind of a neat thing, I like to put video ga game art into the context of art history itself. Anyway, large boy, big snake, don't like that. This is why I can't play Subnautica, because that's too much. That's too big. We shouldn't have a space on Earth that's big enough for something like that to be in. No, I don't like it. I don't like it at all, but it's very cool. Um, again, color, the shock of like bright, almost pinkish, purplish red coming out of the mouth of this thing instantly draws your attention to the most terrifying thing about it, which is the fact that it has teeth on the inside of its mouth! Um, and draws your attention to, like, the action of the picture, which is this giant devouring mouth that's about to make their day really, really shitty. Um, which again, bright contrast with the drabness of the rest of the environment generally, which is mostly dark blue, dark black, a little bit of purple, a little bit of gray here and there. Oh, right, that's a deep card. So that you get a 7-7 a seven, seven for 4. Oh, God. Here's another great character design. Yordle Grifter. Look at this kid. Look at this guy. Don't you love him already? Aren't you ready to give him all your money for no good reason already? <laughs> so this image has almost... This is almost One Piece-like. Like, I feel like there's almost a One Piece aesthetic going on here. Because look at the pirate dudes in the background. Look at this guy. Like... He doesn't have any hips at all. He just has a giant upper body and then he has legs <laughs> sticking out of his giant upper body. That's like One Piece like almost in terms of how extreme the contrast is between Mr. Muscle Guy here whose waist is also way too thin. Um, and then this little beach ball of a man <laughs> standing behind our Yordle friend. It works for the image because this is so faded out and hidden in the background that you kind of don't see it as a complete cartoonish inconsistency. <laughs> but wow, that's a bold move for a character design right there. So I don't know who the lady is who's sitting here, but I know a lot of people want to be stepped on by her, I'm sure. I don't think it's Misfortune, because Misfortune doesn't really wear long white cloaks. Um, but he's certainly trying to grift someone. And again, some of the same techniques that we've talked about already are being used here. He's being highlighted by the bright sunlight that's coming in from somewhere. Literally casting a spotlight. You can you can literally see there's a circle of light on the ground and he's in the middle of it, which highlights him. Then there's that shock of white fur in a background that contains very little bright color, um, which again helps to highlight him. And then you have this bright red, I guess it's a fez or what are they called? Um, they're not called fezes. They're called something caps. I don't remember. Um which again adds a very bright shock of color to a scene that's otherwise mostly relatively desaturated outside of the sunlight. And then you have a little bit of framing where like, or not framing, but uh, composition where the curve of the lady's leg, like that that pointed toe right there, also helps guide your, your eyes a little bit to the thing that she's going to kick in the face if he doesn't come up with the money that he owes her, I think. 
And yeah, nice little composition. Again, a Dutch angle that I don't think is strictly necessary, but here I think, again, the point of the Dutch angle is if you had a right angle, like if you had a completely horizontal angle here, this guy's head and these guys, like these guys here, their heads would be out of frame unless you drastically change the framing. So the artist chose, chose a Dutch angle so that they could get the details that they wanted on the characters in the background, which it doesn't add anything to the mood of the picture as such. Like, I think it works a little bit in that he's clearly trying to pull off a grift, like he's trying to pull off a scam. And so having an unstable atmosphere in the image works on that account, but it's also a little much, I think, for, for the purposes. Here again, the attunement and the mana bubble thing going on. And it's also from Kudos Productions again. And here's another great little character design. This guy is cool. Like, that's, that's a, it's a, it's a little manta ray bastard of some kind. That's a really nice way to do that. Almost like he's wearing a hat. Like a, a, a long flowing cape that comes out of his, out of a hat that he's wearing on his head. That's really cute. And that's really cool, too. Nicely done. Um, so, framing. Here, the entire environment is kind of working together to frame the character. You have this, this arc of foreground objects that kind of block out, like, a good third to yeah a little over a quarter perhaps of the image itself it's just kind of dedicated to foreground objects and then that creates this little well that he snugly fits into with like the curve of his little manta ray wings um going on up here which like creates a really nice composition like this feels like a really well composed image because like this flows together so naturally with the environment and then again, bright light being used to highlight him. This bright light of, of the mana bubble that he's attracted to, um, also helping to draw our eyes to him because we see his eye line going to it. I like the use of green and pink. Like, like that's a really nice contrast to have on this character. Like, it would have been so easy to go with green and then light blue to kind of go with the lightning magic that he's got going on. But, like, the green and pink really gives him that, that ocean creature vibe to him, I think. And almost frog-like feet, too. Cool. That's a very cool little character design. And then there's this guy. <laughs> like, oh, I'm just looking for my date. Uh, I met you on Tinder. You swipe right and everybody's just like, don't look at me, don't look at me, don't look at me, don't look at me. <laughs> oh, poor deep sea creatures. They're always so ugly. Also, this thing is infected by the void. Um. Oh, was, uh, was the... Was the uh, was this a, a she? Sap once completed the Assure Way circuit in just under three minutes. She even had to dodge the little jaws, uh, little dodge shattered hole near the end. Oh, cool. That's a female character. Even better. I like it when female characters aren't like, they aren't wearing, they aren't wearing like makeup or super obviously designed to look stereotypically feminine. That's good. I didn't even notice that. Good catch, chat. Anyway. This guy's void infected, hence the giant gaping eye on the front and the purple coloring. And again, you can see the same framing techniques being used here. Like with the, the arc of the undersea cave thing, framing the character themselves and he's highlighted. They are, it is highlighted with bright light that kind of frames its face right there while everything else is relatively more in shadow. Interestingly though, he, Outside of his eye, like, there's plenty of bright colors on the fish around um, around it, but th those colors are slightly muted in order to ensure that nothing takes away from the primacy of this ugly-ass-looking little bastard, like, my god. <laughs> but yeah, many of the same techniques that we've talked about before, so there probably isn't that much to add. So here, the hunting fleet. This is the counterpart, as we can see to the narwhal, like they spawn um, a narwhal for your opponent also um, once they go. And you can see the composition, um, same arrangement of ships, the, the whale underneath, and here you can see the whale down there and there's ships above, which is a lov lovely little continuity. Like again, something that's that I really like about Legends of Runeterra is the storytelling in the, ar in, the, in the art of the cards, like stuff like Scythria, where you see her arrive in, in the, uh, in Demasi as, a, as an early recruit, then you see her being like a rank-and-file soldier, and then you see her as Scythria the Bold, 
when she like comes into her own as a Demacian leader in her final version of the card. I like the continuity that exists between different cards here. So, um, the ships are obviously the main subject of this picture. Like, the whale is glowing, and, and you can see it down there, but it's also blurred out by the water and isn't really the focus of the image. The focus is the... Um, the vanishing point movement of these ships. You can see they all move in the same direction, but you have this really strong perspective. So if you drew a line through like the center of each ship, you would get a vanishing point that is somewhere like way out in this direction right here, which creates a really strong perspective and gives that really strong sense of speed of these ships like cutting through the water, chasing down their prey, moving really fast. Which is also helped by the design of the sails here. Like all of like you can see all those lines as though the sails are pulled completely taut, like really being pushed by the wind forward. This is a high speed chase that's going on. In terms of color contrast, you have like the static greenish blue of the waters underneath, and then you have the torches on the boats themselves, creating these little orange highlights that makes each ship an object of interest, besides just the contrast between the brownish color of the ship and the dark uh, green-blue of the water. Then you also have these little points of light that draw your attention to the ships themselves. Which is well done. And I like the use of mist here. Like, it, first of all, the mist is really... It gives a really nice atmosphere to the chase, to the whole scene. But also, it helps avoid... Because you can see there's more ships hiding in the background here, but it also avoids having a background that's too detailed taking away from the interest points of, like, the five, six ships that we've got in the foreground here. So, like, that's that's a nice use of the mist to manage the detail. Need to blow my nose again. Again, like seriously, if you if you had these fish people everywhere anyway, why is the card shark not a fish person? Though, I mean, come on. So, the racer scale hunter is some kind of Cthulhu ass looking deep sea motherfucker of some kind. I don't think he's a Vestaya necessarily. He could be. He could be a Vestaya sort of out of the same vein as Nami, but more of a like a squid or octopus person than than a fish person something along those lines i'm not sure where he fits into the tax taxonomy of league of legends but the framing here is cool as hell because he's framed by his prey he's framed by the giant coiling tentacle of whatever enormous octopus creature he has decided to take on and i talk about a cool way to frame a hunter by having him framed with the limbs of his prey that is really fucking badass to me. A male of Nami species? No, I don't think so. I don't think he's a he's a Marai. <clears throat> because the Marai specifically are fish people. We've seen a male of Nami species before in one of the comics for her, and he looked a lot more like a merman rather than this tentacled octopus man nonsense thing going on. Anyway, I like the wound. Like, he's clearly been wounded by something or other, and you see this glowing magic light glowing through. That's a really cool little detail. Like, I'm not sure how it ties into... Like, is his blood just that color, or is he just glowing with magic inside? I think it's probably the same color here as comes out of his eyes, but his eyes are so narrow that you kind of can't tell. So, I don't know about that. It's a cool detail. It just doesn't add much except the point of visual interest. Like, it's this really strong visual color contrast with the rest of the image. But because the storytelling isn't 100% clear to me, I'm not sure what to make of it. Anyway, again, with the very, very thin waist uh, that maybe could use a little bit more space for muscle, especially on something that swims so much. Like, have you seen swimmers? They've got abs for days. Uh, but outside of that, I really like the pose. I like the confident, like, I'm rearing back to throw my spear with the arm out for balance in the front, and then this, like, this confident look over the shoulder as he's twisting into the lunge that he needs to launch the spear at whatever the hell it is he's haunt uh, haunting, hunting, rather. Oh, they're gills! Oh, that makes way more sense. Bubbles come from it. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, gills. That makes way more sense. That's cool, then. That's cool. <laughs> Gills and kills. 
But yeah, lovely composition, like that, like that right there, the framing with the octopus. That is just so badass to me. And the, you can also see lots of motion blur has been applied to the octopus tentacle itself to really imply that it's like swooping right past him, like he's just dodged it and then it's swooping past him and trying to coil back and catch him, but now he's getting ready to throw his spear, like we're in the middle of a combat scene with him. And here again, Kudos Productions, and you can tell instantly from the visual style that it's another Kudos production picture. The little turtle boy is back, and he's got a horn now that he's blowing stuff into, and he's riding whatever the hell this is, this adorable fish axolotl lizard thing looking What the hell is that? It looks amphibian, much more than, than fishy, but it's also cute. Oh, that's adorable. So, framing again. Right here, all of the like the little corals and and the the cliff or whatever this is, and the bright light coming from above, all of that creates a frame here for the main character, who is the sea turtle, uh, boy, and his little and his uh, giant animal friend to inhabit, drawing your attention to this part of the space. And then there's the color contrast with the bright red of this amphibian thing looking creature. Um, drawing your attention to the center of the image. Many of the same techniques we talked about before. Plus, they're adorable! Look at them! Look how cute that is! Again, we're doing a Dutch angle, and here, again, I'm really not sure why. Like, it works, but it's just... Well, it's not... Yeah, it's a Dutch angle, but it's not that strong. Like, you can tell that... that the horizon line is like this. Um, but... I guess it's fine. And here we have the Citrus Courier. A lot of people's new husband, going by what I saw on Twitter when, when his card art was revealed. Whom we saw previously as a member, of course, of Gangplank's crew, because where else would a Citrus Courier have a home? And here again, uh, some of the same composition we've seen already. Like, you have uh, the sails and the ship itself creating this little bubble of space for him to stand up into and dominate that space and then you have the outstretched hand and I'm kind of I'm a little sad that we don't focus more on the outstretched hand with the oranges in the card art but that would be impossible to do within the form factor holding out these sumptuous looking like these oranges look delicious don't they don't they just look like maybe you should peel them first but if you ate them oh man like, they'd be sweet and save, like, really, like, full of juice, and oh, they look good. And that's all down to just the quality of the painting that goes on on these things. Again, that shining bright orange being used to draw your attention. And just so that you don't get too fixated on the, on the juicy oranges that he's offering you, more juicy oranges up here to draw your attention back up here a little bit to take a look at the character himself, who's also, again, sunlight highlighting the character, making him brighter than a lot of the sur surrounding environment, etc., etc. Oh yeah, the furries love this man. <laughs> the furries are very happy they've got a new daddy to worship. I like that he's got golden rings. Like, I like that there's that little sign of wealth on him, and also in his beard, like the little fish hooks that he's got in his beard hair. Um, I think that's pretty cool that like that you get this sense that yeah he's he's a he's a citrus courier, but he's also kind of important to Gangplank's crew, so he makes good money doing what he does. And here's another lovely little detail: you see how on his overalls there, like see how they're straining, like the gut, like the there's this sheer life force of this man, like the vitality of him, the size, the gut of him, is almost bursting out of his own um, overalls. You can see how the how the stitching is kind of straining to contain him, which again is the kind of thing that you can use to create a character who looks like gross and bloated. But here it doesn't make him look bloated. Here it makes him look like, wow, there's a lot in there. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of power and muscle combined with like the big muscly arms. That gives you much more of a sense of a powerful character rather than someone who is like indolent or or flabby. Um, which works really well. Like that's that's the that's the advantage of having the leather stretched out over it is that you get this sense of tension and force that's being constrained, like power, like force that's being constrained rather than like stuff that's being contained from spilling out. Here we have another picture I don't like because no, I don't like the ocean anymore, mommy. I want to go home. Cause goddamn. 
again, this is Kudos Productions. You can kind of see it in their color choices, but oh boy. Oh boy. No, I don't I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Again, scale, one tiny little human person. Just any bitty tiny little and then large boy with big mouth. Ready to devour. And again, I'm not sure if this guy is supposed to be void infested particularly, but I hate that we have the worst uh, deep sea creature, which is the anglerfish with its giant hook teeth. And then it has octopus tentacles as well. No, no, you can't have both. You only get to have one thing. You can't have both of them. Ah. God, this thing is scary. Again, light, a light source literally being used to highlight the creature itself. Little bit of framing going on with like the, the stalactites and stalagmites of this underwater cave. And then this creature is like 90% mouth. Just, oh boy. Oh, I don't want to look at that anymore. Obliterate an enemy with less health than me. How much health does it have? Okay, only four. But it's deep. Oh God. And another case of I don't have enough waste for internal organs. Like, like I said, it's six more vodka. It's like endemic with them. They keep doing it over and over and over again. And I think there's a chance, by the way, that Sheriff Larry at Rose here with the white cloak might be the person that the Yordle Grifter is trying to convince here. Because you can see the boots with the heels and then the white cloak hanging off the side. It might be that she at uh, the... The person that he's trying to convince not to take her in, take him in, is Lariat Rose here. I like the design of her fish horse thing. It's a, it's a seahorse. <laughs> a literal seahorse. That's a very cool character. But my god, lady, you can't possibly, like, I don't, you don't even have a diaphragm to breathe with. What the hell? Anyway. Much of the same stuff we've talked about already. Interestingly, um, the framing here, like you see there's an obvious frame with the, the arc of the bridge here and then the street and stuff like that. But it's not being used to frame her as such. She's not framed by it. She's breaking out of it. Like she's, she's literally escaping from it. It's being used to frame her prisoner. Um, so that he becomes highlighted a little bit as well. So that we know, so that we remember to look at him. And of course also the rope will lead our eye to him. But, um... The character herself is much more highlighted by the bright white cloak that she's wearing where the sunlight is coming down on it, which makes her so much brighter right here than everything else that surrounds her. The horse, the people on the bridge, everything. And then the horse has the color, like the horse has that bright, bright, or not bright, um, saturated is what is the word I'm looking for, has that highly saturated color that stands out from the rest of the environment where everything is like brown and, and a little bit reddish. And then here we have this purple, deep hypersaturated thing that really draws our eye in, which creates a nice contrast with the writer as well. For visual interest. Here we have another bad picture that I don't like. No. No, no, no. That's too big. That's too much. And, oh, God. Okay. So, do you, do you know the worst thing about this creature? Do you know the absolute worst thing about it? The thing I hate the most? The thing I don't like? The thing that, that shouldn't be there? All of that. All of that. That's teeth. It can open its mouth that wide. Ah, the mouth goes all the way down here. Why? Why is that there? No, I don't like that. That's too much mouth. No. Oh, God. I hate the sea so much. Anyway, that's the worst thing about it. Lots of good stuff going on here in terms of, of composition. I don't think this is the same fleet of ships that was hunting down the Golden Narwhal, necessarily. Uh, my, it's probably another one. But, again, with, like, you have this... The light itself up here creates this spot, this point of interest that draws your eye there first because it's the brightest thing in the image. And then that leads you to looking at the head and the mouth of the creature itself and its prey so that you're instantly informed about it. But even if you don't draw your eye here immediately, 
the body of the creature dominates so much of the picture that the swoop of its body will still lead you up here where the light is being used to frame the creature against the prey that it's about to devour in a terrible fashion. And then you get the scale, which is provided by the ships and the fish and the sharks swimming around down here, showing you just how too big this thing is. Because it's too big. It's way too big. Things shouldn't be that big. I don't like it. And then we have the, vis uh, the Vicious Plate Worm, which is summoned with the Plate Worm Egg, which you can get um, from this thing when you summon it. And this is also, again, scale, because that's a Hammerhead Shark, and that's a large boy. Oh, that's a large boy. That's a lot of boy. That's uh, a big boy. And here the composition, I think, is really, really cool, because the whole composition of this image revolves around this glowing light tower thing. You can see that all the fish, all the sharks, everything seems to be kind of circling it. And circling it more than anything else is the giant swooping tail of this enormous, long, lanky, predatory body. Like, encircling the whole of the thing. So you have this point, again, of visual interest with the light drawing your eye here, and then you have the swoop of this thing encircling it all. Which I think is a really cool way to compose an image like this and to really make it look... Like, first of all, help the scale, like, make this thing look big, but also just to help, like, emphasize the, the visual idea that this thing controls this part of the sea. Like, this is its territory. This is where it lives. This is where it encircles the world and devours what it wishes. It is the apex predator of this moment. Yeah, mom protecting its egg. That's probably true. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah you're right, because that's that's what that is. It's a plate worm egg. Ah, good catch. Where were we? Right, the smooth soloist. This is another artist, Chin Liqui, uh, which I hope I'm pronouncing Lik Likui, Likui, something like that. Um, who, again, I don't know if they're a freelancer or a rioter specifically, but... Uh, they're also one of the artists who's been working on this. And here you can see, again, a very different um, aesthetic for faces um, than we have with a lot of the other characters. Like, the rendering of the scene is mostly the same style, but faces especially is where you can really tell the difference between various character artists. Now, this is a really cool character. Like, I, I like that there's a Vestaya in the Bilgewater who's just stealing from everyone. And again, the same techniques are being, uh, are being used. Here, the character is framed in an interesting way. Like, lots of times we've talked about characters who are framed by, like, arches and, like, like natural frames in the environment that frame them, like, that become frames around them. Here, we're doing something different. The character is framed not by an arch, but by a pillar that becomes this, like, this vertical slot in the environment that creates a a space for the character to occupy that serves two purposes. Um, it, it First of all, it does the framing job of like giving you a frame for the character to be in to draw your eye. It also tells us why these people can't see her. It's because she's hiding behind the pillar. Now, with all this flapping fabric and her long tail and the long flowy hair, I feel like it should probably be kind of easy to spot her standing there holding her gold out in her hands while it's tingling to the floor. But... In terms of the visual storytelling, you kind of get that, oh, she's hiding behind the pillar, that's why they can't see her. Even if logically it doesn't make sense, emotionally, it still makes sense. Um, but yeah, like, cool character. Uh, kind of generic beauty, which bores me a little bit, but I know that's just me. But, like, I like the purplish hue, like the sort of whitish purplish hue of her, of her skin and her fur and her hair, contrasted against that bright red... Um, coat that she's wearing, or uh, whatever the heck that is, tunic? Yeah, something along those lines. And then the other thing that's being highlighted, other than the character, is the gold that she's stolen. Like, it's literally got these little glowy <laughs> uh, lens flares going on on the gold just to highlight even more that that's what she's been doing. She's been stealing from everybody. And I do like the smugness of her look. Like, it's just like, eh, too easy. Like, that, 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 easy confidence that she's got going on. That's a good... That builds the character out quite nicely. And she has a waist. Like, it's not a lot, but she has more than misfortune. So that's... That's something. <laughs> also, reduce the cost of allies in your hand 
and deck by two? Motherfucker. If that wasn't a seven cost, it would be so broken. It might still be broken. So here we have Misfortune's ship, the Siren, with a Y to make it cool. And there's a couple of interesting things going on here. First of all, um, unlike Gangplank's ship, where he flies black sails, as we know, Misfortune has these bright white, almost pink sails. You can see there's a little bit of pink shading on them. And that's like that alone kind of helps the ship stand out brilliantly against the backdrop of the rest of the image, just because they're so bright. But also because they have this red tint to them. Like, they're not super pink, but they have this slight red tinting to them that makes them stand out even more against the blue sky and the general bluish aesthetic of the rest of the environment. Um, which is just like a clever little way to do it, to make the sails look white but still have like a color contrast with the rest of the environment. And I love this detail, like that when her cannons fire, they create a smoke ring that's shaped like a heart. That's so fucking extra. <laughs> lesbian ship, yes. Holy shit, yes. That is the most lesbian ship, holy fuck. And I believe the Yordle who's sitting on the cannon over here um, is the... Crackshot Corsair. And the reason I think so is because of the hair. You can see it here. She's got those long dread ponytail things going on as well. So I'm reasonably sure that's the Crackshot Corsair um, sitting on the cannon there in the background. SS Friendship. Oh yeah, just gals being pals, my friend. Just gals being pals. Nothing, nothing sapphic going on over here at all. <laughs> With the mermaids on the prow. So compositionally, other than that, like, Misfortune is very obvious because, again, with the white sails, she stands out with her black bustier, but uh, not a lot going on compositionally there. It's just a really, it's just a nice little illustration. And, of course, it draws a Misfortune for you. Presumably, you have to have MF in your deck um, in order for that to actually work, but it's quite cool. And then there's Riptide Rex here, who's a piece of shit. Like, God, seven cannon barrages dealing two... To my u seven, seven of them. I play a Poro deck. This is evil. I can't let any. I can never let a fucking Bilgewater player get to turn eight now, ever. I can't because he's just gonna he's just gonna eat them all with cannon barrages. Also, rip to anyone who plays a uh, barrier. <laughs> barrier is gonna get fucked by this. Anyway. Look at this badass motherfucker. Look at this cool ass shit. If this guy isn't one of Klet's cousins, Riot is doing something wrong, but like, <laughs> this is some Mad Max Fury Road ass. Holy fuck. This is very, very, very cool. <laughs> like, oh man, this looks like, this looks like, you know those toy commercials back in the 80s when everyone was trying to, to like do ripoffs of the Transformers and the Ninja Turtles? That's what this looks like. This looks like one of those things that you get, you get like a TV commercial with this like really cool anime animation with like a tank sharks, da -da 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 -da, tank sharks, tank sharks fight against the evil of the shark, blah, 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 the whale people, blah, blah, blah. new from Mattel, whale shark, tank shark with guns, real shark moving action, fires cannonballs, blah, blah. Like that's what this looks like. Everything about this just suggests ridiculous 80s uh, collectible toy to me. Very Daka. Very good. I love it. Like, this <laughs> so funny. So, again, compositionally, everything except the Riptide Rex and his handler is blurry. Like, you can see there's just blur on everything else, um, which helps focus them in the center of the screen. Then there's the highlighting coming from, like, the light that's falling down on them, as well as just compositionally, they are the largest thing in the entire frame, as they should be. And, yeah, I mean, outside of just this is fucking cool, I don't think there's that much to say about it. Because <laughs> this is, this is very... But again, if there are shark people in this world, why wasn't the card shark a shark person? Honestly. Anyway, I love this guy. I hope he gets to have voice lines. I want to see this guy have an interaction with Kled. Like, <laughs> I want to see those run into each other. Which leads us to the Dreadway, which is Gangplank's version of Misfortune's card. Draw Gangplank double all damage dealt by allies, which again, fuck you if you play this, ever. I hate you. <laughs> 
That is a cool ship, though. Like, look at that. I like the use of, like, these metal accents to kind of almost indicate a beard or giant teeth on the ship itself. This is also very, like, over-the-top Pirates of Dark Water, edgy, 80s toy commercial kind of thing going on. Again, a sense of scale is provided by having tiny, tiny, tiny human characters contrasting against the massive scale of the rest of the ship. There's a little bit of framing going on with the sails that, like, the sails kind of eat the top part of the screen, which means you're free to focus on the victim, which is down here, but more primarily on the giant gaping mouth and these howitzer cannons that Gangplank has somehow managed to install on them. Surely that would just tear the ship apart the moment they fired. Um, and then, like, uh, these cannon slots, I have to imagine they're cannon slots, like, indicating eyes with the glow coming out of them. And again, here we have an interesting, like, uh, we're working with a Dutch angle once again. <clears throat> Very Dutch, uh, with, like, the horizon line is, like, something like this, I think. Or maybe uh, something along those lines. And uh, the ship itself is contrasting against it by leaning to one side really, really heavily. Um, which creates a nice visual dynamic in the image, I think. <sighs> and that is it for the Bilgewater cards. Only took us two and a half hours. <laughs> Which means we can now move on to, well, all of the other ones. And this is where I have to get a hold of my card list because I can't sort um, cards by set in the actual thing here. So I'm going to have to grab Demacia, only the Bilge Water cards, filter for that. Thank you very much. But first, I'm going to take myself a drink because, good lord, I'm dry. So, how are you all enjoying the stream? Like, there's still a thousand of you-ish, so I have to imagine I'm not being too boring. How y'all doing? I need I need a break for just one second, so let's talk to chat instead for a moment. No Ilawi. No, I'm afraid. There's no Pike either. I'm sure they'll be added eventually. You have a meeting in nine hours and you should sleep. Oh, Keechin, go to bed. Honestly, the, the, the VOD will be there. It will be there. Don't worry. You're enjoying it a lot. I'm <laughs> decaying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you are. It makes it worth it. Thousand people and not a single dislike? Jesus, that can't last. Favorite champion? Well, the favorite one so far... Like, the favorite new champion that's been added to the game, I think, is probably... I mean, I like Maokai a lot in terms of his mechanic. Because it's just so mean. <laughs> like, you just eat the enemy's deck. Um, but in terms of the artwork, that's a little bit tougher. I feel like it's probably going to be Vi. Because I just love that she's running on a wall and smashing an entire alley's worth of buildings. In order to do her work. Because fuck Piltover. Um, probably. Probably going to be Vi. Next Bilgewater champion is Tom Kinch. Are we sure about that? Do we know that? I hope so. <laughs> Told a friend of mine you were streaming the cards. He screamed when you saw him when he saw you were over two hours. Oh, well, poor guy. I hope it didn't startle him. Ah, eight dislikes. Yeah, I thought so. I figured. Let's see. Vi is level two. Nectar two is wrong. Yeah, we'll talk about that when we get there. How can you play this game? You just download it from the Runeterra website. That's pretty easy. It's been leaked. Yeah, I know Targon is the next region. That's pretty much confirmed by the leaks. I didn't remember that Tom Kench had voice lines. Oh, yeah, he does. Um, is Misfortune bisexual because of the interactions? I think she is either bi or lesbian. Yeah. Bum, 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 bum. Is there Kled? No, no Kled, unfortunately. Am I excited for the big summer event that Riot teased? No, not as like I don't know what's in it, so I don't I don't know what to be excited for as such. Unless they lore for Sharima would be nice. Like, what's happening with Azir? We get to have an update. 
I'm pretty sure they're gonna be adding sh uh, after Targon. They're gonna be adding Shurima. I'm gonna predict that because sh like that. I'm pretty sure they will be. Um, did any cards push new lore? I think a few of them do. I think there's a little bit um, of new lore being pushed with some of the new cards. But I think Necrit is probably going to have a much more co uh, cohesive uh, breakdown of all of it. Will they ever do Bandle City? No, I don't think Bandle City will ever be added to Legends of Runeterra because Yordles in Legends of Runeterra are everywhere. And I don't think it would make sense to have a specific Yordle region. I don't think they'll add Bandle City. I really don't. Maybe, but I, I don't think so. Ishtal will probably happen as well, but I think, like, I'm I'm almost 100% convinced that it's going to be Targon and then uh, Shrima. Like, that's my prediction. Yone as the next champion. No, Yone is not going to be the next champion. That's been confirmed many, many times that he is dead and he's going to stay dead. So unless they're pulling a Senna on us, no, I don't think so. <clears throat> A Void. Yeah, the Void will probably be the last one, I think, because the Void is so poorly realized. Like, in the lore, we know so little about it. And the the Void is also split. Like, we have the Void in... in The Freljord is very different than the Void in Shirima, um, which is very different than the Void in the Deep Sea. So I don't know when the Void is going to be coming up. Like, if anything, they would do it, like, as an as a... Um, Ikathia part of Shirima with like have you have some void creatures like uh, you get Kaisa perhaps from the void in Shirima something like that or a void expansion where every region gets void cards but it's not a whole region all on its own something along those lines I think okay let me take another drink and let's move on with the new cards for Demacia that shouldn't take too long So, let me just get up my list of cards. Right. We'll start with Quinn, obviously. <clears throat> so, many of the same tricks we've talked about already in terms of, like, using bright colors and highlighting um, just with, like, bright light falling on the character in order to make them stand out from their environment. Also, a little bit of framing where you can see, like, most of the trees and stuff in the background don't really like you don't see any trees like in the background of um uh Quinn herself or indeed in the background of Valor they don't really overlap with it we get this very low angle looking up at her and again with a dutch angle which again i think is to make space for valor in the composition which doesn't really add very much it's, it's dynamic i guess um but Quinn herself is highlighted against the bright blue sky where her, she has these dark demacian colors instead and then like the gold of her helmet she's also had a little bit of a character update um like there's a little it not it's not a, like a full visual update of the character but she has a slightly different aesthetic going on for one thing they've removed some of the bulk um in her in her base design in league of legends she has a lot more bulk around her hips and her waist um, which they have removed here in order to make her look a little bit lighter, I think. The claws on her shoes are spurs. Birds have them on the backs of, uh, of their legs. Uh, chickens, for example, roosters will have really big spurs. They use them to fight with. Um, they, they've removed some bulk from her to make her look a little bit lighter and more agile, whereas Quinn in the base game is kind of bulky in a lot of ways, which has always been kind of... It has always conflicted a little bit with her whole she's a light scout character who, like, travels over mountains and stuff, that she had so much bulk on her. So it's a nice change that they removed some of that, I think. Um, yeah. Like, the main splash art of Quinn is more about her than Valor. Like, Valor is there, and she's kind of pointing him in a particular direction, and he's about to take off, but it's mostly about uh, uh, Quinn herself. Whereas... Her upgraded, her leveled up version is not about her at all, really. Like, she's there, and when you look at the card art, she's the one who's, like, who's, like, centered. But when you look at the full art, Valor is the main character here. Absolutely the main character. First of all, he's in focus, which Quinn isn't. And also, here you can see, uh, here you can see a really clear demonstration, because normally Quinn and Valor have the same color. Like, Quinn's blue, blue cloak is the same color as Valor's feathering. But here you can see they've desaturated the cloak a lot in order to make Valor the most colorful thing in the image that really stands out. 
Um, and that's again that little compositional trick we've talked about many times before with using bright light and really eye-catching color in order to control where people look at the image. And also a really nice little detail is not just like this motion blur, this is like a, a, a simple motion blur Photoshop filter, I think, that's been applied out here. But if you look at the grass down here, you can see they've painted these speed streaks, like literally directly painted them into the grass texture. And that looks really, really good. And I kind of wish they'd done that for all of the image instead of using these filter effects. Um, but it, it looks really, really cool. So you get a great sense of speed, like you get a great sense of valor, like taking off and flying super fast. One thing that does get me a little bit, though, is take a look at Valor here, his face, with the beak, with the little extra like uh, hook on it, and like the the like the feathers that kind of almost look like a little bit of a hairstyle. And then Valor here, this feels like it was very very heavily referenced from a picture of a real eagle. And it kind of, he looks too much like a, like a, just a normal ass bird. And he kind of lacks a little bit of that fantasy quality that he kind of has in the original. Let me see if I can find uh, Quinn's original splash art. Okay, let me see if I can get that on screen for a second. Uh, do I have a win window capture? Just a moment, this is gonna take me a sec. Firefox, thank you. There we go. So take a look at Valor here. Right, you can see that very hooked beak, like this, the, the str those streaking feathers that are distinctly decide designed to, uh, like, emulate a, almost a hairstyle. He's kind of anime-ish. And then take a look at him compared to just a bird here. So that to me is a little bit like, I would like him to be more of specifically like an actual fantasy bird rather than just some random normal bird. Um, and also as someone is pointing out in chat, yeah, he looks a little bit small in this picture when he's supposed to be a giant, like a huge bird. I feel like probably it's the wingspan that's a bit too, like I feel like this was very heavily referenced from a real bird um, where it should probably have been more fantasy distorted with a much longer wingspan and like more of a Valor-like face. Because even here, like look at that, all of a sudden, much more of a fantasy bird aesthetic on, on, on his head. Um, much feels much less referenced from from the art of a real bird, which like, mm. but yeah, um, that's that's probably like birds are hard. I have I've I spent some time trying to learn to illustrate birds of prey, and they are really difficult. So I don't blame the artist for using reference really heavily if that's what they did. Um, but I prefer this version of him. Like this looks more like the valor I I know from the game. And again, um, same stuff, like Valor has these really dark, saturated colors, and most of the background doesn't. And that's what makes him stand out, as well as him just dominating the whole composition um, by taking up so much space in it. And I like the sense of scale here. Like, I like the sense of, like, flying high above this vast, impressive, mountainous landscape that you have this really floating feeling in this image, like you're you're gliding along next to him, which I think is really nice. That's a good that's a good mood for the picture to have. Hey, good job, Dikayan. <laughs> Would have loved to see more of Misfortune's crew. Yeah, same for me, Patrick. Uh, it would be nice if Misfortune had more cards specifically with her crew members. Right, next one. Let me look at the card list. That would be the Green Fang Warden, who is down here somewhere. Just gonna buy a couple of those for myself because I need that for one of my decks, I think, because he has the barrier and the scout. So, Green Fang Warden, um, same general compositional tricks that we've talked about before. The trees are kind of giving a little, not that much of a frame, but it does create a little bit of a, a, a like a, a space for him and his dog to occupy. But the thing I really like about this image, again, is the storytelling that Probably a Noxian, going by the design of the arrow, is shooting at this guy, and then his dog catches it in mid-flight, saving him. Like this, this like master and his pet 
dynamic thing going on. I think that's really nice. That's a little, that's a nice little bit of visual storytelling that instantly tells you like of the partnership between the man and the animal, which is quite well done. Yeah, like I said, um, try hard. <laughs> I, I have 500 wild cards because Riot, like I say, uh, like the disclosure says, they basically gave me as many wild cards as I need to buy every single card in the game. Um, Riot were kind enough to reach out and do that for me, which is why the disclaimer, um, the disclosure is right there on screen for you. It's not because I've played 10 billion games. <laughs> um, I like the design of the dog because, again, here's where, like, the thing that was kind of missing with Valor was a little bit more of a mix um, of, like, fantasy and real-world animal. And here you have this shaggy sheepdog-looking thing, but then you look at the anatomy of its mouth and, like, the paws with these long claws and this slightly uncanny anatomy, and you get much more of a sense of, yeah, it's a dog ish thing it's not literally a dog it's a dog ish kind of thing um which i like like i like that um as a design as a design sensibility and again bright light used to highlight the face of the main character used to highlight the dog as well making them stand out from the background etc etc saturated colors drawing your attention Let's see next one in demacia would be the loyal badger bear So this one looks almost more uh, Ionian to me at first. Like the first time I saw it, I was like, that looks more like an Ionian kind of card. And um, part, of, part of the reason why is because you have this colorful, um, lavish uh, foliage. That's the word I'm looking for, foliage. You have this colorful, lavish foliage in the background, which is generally characteristic of a lot of the Ionian cards. And then the fact that you have this yordle and, and an animal on the thing, like it's more nature imagery where Demacia tends more towards knightly imagery, like knights and like people on steeds and swords and armor and stuff like that. So in immediately it looked a little bit more Ionian in its aesthetic to me, but leaving that aside for the moment, this guy looks cool, doesn't he? Like grizzled yordle scout warrior. Isn't it weird that there are Yordles in the Demacian military, by the way? Like, I know about Poppy, but she's like a wandering someone, like, wanders around Demacia looking for a hero. Not not someone who's part of the Demacian armed forces. Like, how did he train? How did no one realize? Anyway, same techniques we've talked about before. The framing is done by the tree that they're both sitting in. Like, this tree trunk here creates this, this ledge, this space for them separate from like the vast and windswept background back here. Bright light highlights both the characters and highlights the similar, I like the visual affinity. Um, that's what it's called, by the way, when you have characters where like they have traits that match each other. Like you, when, when you say that a pet looks like their owner, that kind of thing, that's visual affinity in in, uh, in in like visual design language. And there's visual affinity between these two characters. They have the same expression, but they also have the same eyebrows. They have like the same giant mustache coming off their very similar looking noses, which creates a, like a, a pleasing symmetry between the two of them. It has the interesting side effect of making the badger bear seem sentient somehow to me, which I don't know how you would solve that necessarily, <clears throat> but it's like it, it creates a really nice visual dynamic partnership between the two of them. Like you, you get that they're on the same wavelength because they look the same. Oh, hey, it's true what they say. Pets look like their owners. Yes, true. Thank you, chat, for pointing out that they already pointed that out. <laughs> okay, next one would be the uh, Great Horn Companion. And that's a five cost, so that's down. Here he is. So, again... The use of light and color to designate a main character in a piece, because the main subject of this piece, once again, is not the ranger themselves, but their mount, their companion. Um, and the way that we know that is because the whole composition revolves around them. You can see the framing of like this, this, the curvature of this hill rolling down, leading into the trunks of these trees right here, creates this space that the uh, that the great horn completely occupies and then it's highlighted with like the bright light and the bright colors on its head right there so that becomes designated as the main character and the ranger themselves um despite also being in direct sunlight are much more drab 
and much less highlighted than their companion is. Basic compositional uh, technique used hot with to high efficiency. And I like the character design of this thing that it has the hind legs of a horse, but then like the front of it is kind of like an elk of some kind or a moose. But it's a moose with like really sharp horns <laughs> that looks really aggressive and dangerous. And then it has this like mottling on the front legs that almost looks like, what are they called, an okapi. Um, which again is that chimera creature design that I really like in League of Legends. I like that a lot more than just having normal ash sharks hanging out with Nautilus to have this chimera aesthetic in the creature design. And also again, the visual storytelling here is pretty good. Um, we have this ranger character who's clearly scouting out a battlefield of some kind where Demacia has suffered some kind of defeat as you can tell by the discarded Demacian helmet lying in the environment. And then it's uh, Gwenevieve Elmhart, I think, is the next one. Yeah, she's the last one, too, of Demacia. So this is the same character that we see um, in the companion. Like, this is her, but off her mount, clearly in some kind of... She's kind of fleeing, kind of looking around pensively from perhaps a failed battle or something. And here... Either she's riding into the battle that Demacia loses, or she's coming back for revenge. Either way, many of the same compositional tricks again. Here you can see how light is used to occlude, um, to, to basically de-emphasize the characters that are following behind her, but then the light that falls on her and her companion, this bright golden light of victory, which Demacia and cards, lots of cards have this exact aesthetic, like with golden light of victory leading characters to glory. Um, you can see it here, especially like with the golden light behind her, highlighting this angel Valkyrie person as she charges into the hordes of the undead. Um, that's very much the same thing that's going on here with the light itself acting as a vanishing point for the perspective of the piece, but also as like the the, the light of Demacian victory charging her onwards to to battle. Basically, it's, it's that scene from uh, Two Towers where Gandalf charges in with all the riders and the sun at their backs. It's it's that kind of aesthetic. And again, the main character of the piece is Guinevere herself, but because the companion creature is also fairly highlighted, you get this sense of partnership between them. Like that there is this connection visually that emphasizes their connection in terms of the storytelling. And that's it for Demacia, I think, which means we can move on to the Freljord. We're just going to do these in order, pretty much. And talk about Sejuani. Now, I really, really, really like Sejuani's card. Because her base splash has kind of the same energy um, in, in some ways as, um, as Gangplank's leveled up splash. Like this thing. Where you have this one character, and then behind them you see the reason to fear them. Like this is this is why they're terrifying, right? That kind of that kind of feeling and sensation. Um, with Sichuani, it's just delivered in terms of like, oh yeah, she's riding the big boar and she like she's got her mace out and the flail and stuff. But the reason why you're scared of Sichuani, like really fucking scared of her, is that she's got all of this behind her. She rides in front of that. All of that follows wherever she goes. That's why she's terrifying. And that's why I, that's what I really like is that the composition is so minimalist. Like there's nothing here. There's just this bright, like this endless plain of snow, no details, no trees, no rocks, no anything. Just this white blank plain of snow, a war mother and her host. That's a really powerful composition. Like, that works really well. And again, colors here are being used to highlight Sichuani, especially her weapons made of true ice and her true ice helmet as well, which must be murder on a headache to wear that thing. Drawing your attention to her without the use, like, we've talked so much about light and highlighting, right? That's not used here at all. There's no highlighting. There's no bright edge lighting. There's no sunlight coming down from, from, from up top. She has the same lighting and color aesthetic pretty much as the rest of her war host, except those bright blue magical weapons that she's wielding, highlighting her as something to be feared. Like, this is this is one of the better best cards in, in the set entirely. And then we get to the second one. This is much more like in the style of the rest of um, 
of Legends of Runeterra. Like, the thing that makes this the Sichuani base card stand out so much is, like, there just aren't any other cards in the game that really have this sparse, dark, moody aesthetic to them. Most of them have some kind of comedy or action or lightheartedness or... Or, like, some, some sense of cartoonish fun. Even, like, the deep water, like, the deep sea Freljord creatures had a little bit of that sense of fun to them. A little bit of that sense of that colorfulness to them. Whereas, like, Sichuani's base is so... There's only one color in it, and it's this bright blue. Everything else is just, like, drab and dour. And then we get to the second one when she's leveled up. And it's much more traditional Legends of Runeterra. It's much more... Here's an action scene of, of her riding into the fray, and the battle is being joined, and, like action is happening we have like these bright pink colors of like this the sunset outlining her behind her and we have like snow falling everywhere much more energy and action in that one where the other one is so quiet it's scary yeah deep sea uh, bilge water not freljord so again framing sichuani here is framed mostly by her opponents like you have the the hair and the body of this character in the foreground then the shield of this person who she's about to knock down then the body of this warrior that she's charging towards, all of that creating this space right here for her to occupy as the dominant force that blasts everything else around her away, um, which emphasizes her power as a character and her power as a warrior. And then her pose does a good bit of visual storytelling because Sichuani isn't just fighting here. She's not just like knocking people down left and right. She's also commanding. You can see that, like that outstretched finger, like warriors to that side. That kind of aesthetic with her is that she's charging into battle, but she's also commanding the battle. She's in control of the battle. She's giving orders. And really effective use of like these spears and arrows that are flying to create, like they're basically speed lines. Like they're basically speed lines in the image, creating this sense of speed as she charges forward on Bristle into the fray. And again, the bright blue colors of her true ice implements are doing a good job of, like, highlighting her a little bit in contrast to the environment, but then also there's this lovely pink lighting in the background that she's being contrasted against, being much more blue and brown in her aesthetic. Okay, next Freljord card would be... Probably the Ruthless Raider. Oh, you're tough and you have Overwhelm? Thank you very much. Oh, that's cool, isn't it? That's nice. And terrifying, but nice. She could use a little bit more of a waste, like so many other other cards in, in Legends of Runeterra, but she has enough that I believe... Like, this is the thing, is like, I don't necessarily want the characters to be realistic. I don't necessarily want them to have realistic... Like, because, like, if you wanted to give this character realistic a realistic uh, waist size, then she would be built like a fucking tree trunk, because... That's the kind of body shape that you have when you're a warrior who fights bears on a mountain. Like, that you have this huge, hugely powerfully developed core set of muscles. I don't necessarily want them to be realistic, but I just want to be able to believe that there are abs enough in there and enough organs to keep her alive and and keep her powerful. Anyway, I see people are um, asking to be stepped on again, or at least thinking it. <clears throat> so... Same compositional ideas that we got already. Like, you can see the the debris of the destruction that she's causing. You can, see, If you pay attention, you can see this curve. Like this round, almost circular shape that's being cleaved by this giant war pick that she's wielding. Especially here. That creates a little bit of like a circular framing space for her to occupy. Um, which, which like helps ground the composition somewhat. Um, and then there's just the fact that she's big in the image, like she's fully two-thirds of the image is, like, occupied by her space. Which makes her stand out. And then the bright flame of the fire um, that's been set on the village in the background also does a good job of framing her out with contrast. Doing that, like, this gorgeous edge lighting up around her face especially. Like, that right there, that's really freaking cool. And it makes her look terrifying. Um... When you look at her too long. I don't know what's up with the shield, like with the pig's nose on it. I guess that's a symbol that, like, she's a, she's a Winter's Claw. So I guess they take the symbol of the boar as a sign of power for them, which is interesting. I didn't actually know that. Hmm. Let's see. Ember Maiden is next. <laughs> I like her. 
<laughs> oh, that's cool. <clears throat> so, again, the weapon is a pick. It's a war pick. So, again, framing. The burning village is over here, but over here we have the trees giving way to this open field of sky, which then becomes the frame for the character to be contrasted against. You can see she stands out very strongly from that background. What I love about this picture is the acting, like her attitude. <laughs> Just chin up, like the lips pouting, almost like she's a moody teenager, like walking out of an argument with her parents or something. It's like, no, that'll show you to tell me to stay home from Coachella. <laughs> and then dragging this giant burning spiked club out of the wreckage of the burning buildings with the little little specks of fire burning in her mohawk still. That's really cool. I like the acting on this. That's pretty funny. But again, the same thing, like li the lighting of the fire of the village being used to highlight the character and so on and so forth. Deal one damage to everything. Oh, that's going to be good with Vladimir decks. Let's see. The Wolf Rider is another new one, I think. Yes. So here, I like this wolf. This is Mars Studio. That's a studio we haven't run into yet, I think, or at least I didn't notice. Um, that's another one of the studios that have been doing illustrations for Legends of Runeterra is Studio Mar. And they too, you can tell they have a different painting aesthetic um, than a lot of the other studios have too. We don't have a character's face to focus on, but I really like this wolf face. Like, I like the wrinkle, like the, rawr, like the real snarl that's going on in these completely cartoonish. It almost has kind of a Warcraft 3 aesthetic a little bit. Like that, that particular style of like Warcraft in the olden days, when it was a little bit more on the cartoony side. Um, which I think is very cool. So this is a this is a bunch of bunch of Winter's Claw raiders raiding an Avarosan village, I believe. Um, and again, theoretically, the rider is um, the main character in the piece here. Theoretically, it's the rider, but when you look at the full composition, the main character really is the wolf, and they're both highlighted with the same like golden light of. Well, a fire, fiery raid at dawn. Um, but the wolf has like this huge prompt, like fully half of the picture is pretty much dedicated to the front of the wolf itself. So in the card art, the wolf rider is the main character, but in the splash art, the wolf itself becomes the main character of the piece with the rider basically playing second banana to this large and fuzzy boy. Let's see. Next up, Ursine Spirit Walker. So again, you can see the composition happening a little bit here with, um, like, basically just the environment, the, the curvature of this, creating this wide field of open sky against which he's contrasted with the shock white of his, like, Ursine coat, as well as the fact that he's just more saturated in his colors, especially those golden, like, golden, uh, blue claws that he's swiping through the air in anger and the glowing eyes drawing attention to him but also subtly look at the clouds here like the clouds this this these circular circular clouds the lines that they draw like if you drew a line through them all of them point you towards him as well which again helps make him the center of attention in the image itself so the ursine are something that i imagine we're probably going to get more lore about once volibear finally comes out um, and I'm, I'm going to be disappointed with Volibear, the Volibear rework because they didn't go with, like, the horrifying Eldritch monstrosity thing that they wrote him to, into being in Udyr's story. But, you know, beggars can't be choosers, and Volibear mains wanted something different, which leads us on to the Stormclaw Ursine, which is, like, his ascended form. Presumably, that's what he's transforming into. Like, in this scene, he's transforming into this version of himself. Um, where here, like, here you can see the Dutch angle makes sense. Here's where a Dutch angle actually adds something to the mood of the piece, because this guy is shattering the earth, throwing everything around him in, a like, a fit of rage, and so it's perfectly appropriate that we are completely off balance, off center, like, falling down and trembling before his might. One detail I do like, one little Eldritch horror thing that they've kept. He has a second mouth inside his main mouth a human mouth that screams 
Which, like, that's a good detail. That's like some alien shit right there. Um, which again helps emphasize this idea that he's wearing the bear as a second skin over his own body. Um, which is terror which is terrifying. <laughs> and also the other thing, like here he's wearing these wooden antlers. You can clearly see they're like strapped to him or something like that. But here it looks a lot more like they're growing out of his back, which was something that was also teased a little bit in in like the Volibear story that we got in in uh, Udyr's updated lore also had him like building spires of dead wood to like spear the bodies of his enemies on um which like which I thought was like a really cool idea that seems to be kind of being brought out a little bit here with the the tree branches also like they're 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 like lightning bolts you see like with their six sacking and their sharp lines they look like lightning bolts as well which again I suppose is to honor the war god, the lightning god, the bear. Again, lots of uh, motion blur being used to emphasize the power of his roar. You can even see it creating little speed lines in the environment all around him and the cracks and stuff in the earth, all of it drawing you to him as the undeniable center of the image. Let's see, the last thing is the Tusk Raider, which, yeah, it draws us to Johnny. I thought it might. Let's go, lesbians! <laughs> so, just a crew of powerful warrior women, which I definitely appreciate. And I also appreciate that, look at the girl up here. She's got an actual waist that seems to be able to contain abs. The same thing goes for this lady right here. Actual waists that can contain muscle, which I appreciate. This lady is a little thin for me, but, you know, whatever. But yeah, compositionally, here we have a frame that's created by the two warriors out on the sides, create this, like, especially between their swords, creates this space for the Tusk Raider's, like, long neck to kind of burst into. And then we have the torches of the warriors who are still on the ship, creating this light and contrast with the rest of the environment, drawing our attention there. Um, and here again, the Dutch angle seems to be... I hear I feel like the Dutch angle is actually fully unnecessary because like it's kind of about creating more space for the lady warrior on the left but like it's a little much I feel like it this this composition might be stronger with like a, a more like not a completely horizontal angle but a slightly more horizontal angle Right, that was the last of the Freljord cards, I think, which means it's time to move on to Ionia. And here, the first one we're dealing with is Lee Sin. Who is fairly ripped, isn't he? Good lord. Like, he, he looks so awkward in-game, like his character model is so weird and spindly and odd. And then you look at him in a card art, and he's like, sh brick shit house right there. <laughs> so, again, much of the same stuff that we've talked about before. The tree in the foreground here, as well as the ground, creates a little, a little bit of a frame, like creating a, a space here for him to occupy. And then the light of the magic jar things that he's got, as well as this mystical light that seems to be coming from below, which is golden, frames him out against the blue and the purple and the like the the dark greens of the background creating like this this zone of light that he occupies making him backlit into the environment i see people talking daddy in chat already yes yes i believe that may be the intentional point of <laughs> this particular version of him i do like that they've made his ponytail so long that he can wrap it around his own neck and kind of wear it like a scarf that's pretty cool Anything else interesting here? No, I mean, I like the little glowy berries on the tree here, or the bush. I don't know what they are, but it's, it's cool that there's magic berries growing there, or something. <clears throat> and then again, this is kind of like a Sichuani situation where we have a very calm, quiet energy in the first version of her, and then second version is him in full anime action mode, just kicking people in the head. Specifically, he seems to be fighting members of uh, Set's Cult of Shadows. No, Order of Shadows, rather. And he kicks this guy so hard that his head just bursts... bursts open like the Invisible Man. And he falls over. So, again, Lee Sin is lit. 
literally lit, um, lit up by the sunlight coming from the back here. All of his opponents are much more shadowed and much more subdued. There's a frame being created by the body of the one falling opponent and the other opponent that's that's confronting him that creates a frame for Lee Sin to exist inside. And then, of course, Lee Sin is just way more colorful than they are. So all of the same stuff we talked about before being deployed in the same way. Um, let's see. Claws of the Dragon would be next. Uh, lady, you have so much muscle on your back. Where the hell is your waist? No, I will never shut up about it. I know it's your mileage may vary. It's a personal preference thing, but this is too much stylization for me. Anyway, again, I don't have a lot to add um, to the points we've already discussed, except that here there's two frames. First, there's the frame of the mountains, right? creating this space here for her to occupy, but then there's the frame of the light of the full moon, which creates a frame for her head and her upper torso to occupy, so that your eye is drawn here first, then you see the rest of it, and then you go out and you search for the details around the periphery, where these cool-ass looking claw weapons that she is swinging around, and I guess she's supposed to be Spider-Manning her way across the mountainside or something? I'm not really sure. One thing that's not very good about this piece, I think, is I'm not clear on what her action here is supposed to be. Like, is she swinging on the ropes? Is she, like, doing martial arts practice? Where is the ground relative to her? Is she high up in the air or is she really close to the ground with these cliffs here? There's some, there's, there's a lack of clarity to the action that I feel like could probably be fixed a little bit. But other than that, like, most of the same things we've discussed already are still in action right here. I like the pink of the leaves here being used to create a little bit of a color contrast with much of the environment. Um, which also gives a little bit more of a feeling of, of a lively environment rather than just, like, static mountains. <clears throat> then we have this cutie. Tiny, adorable little ninja baby. Or monk baby. Girl. Something, something. So all of these, by the way, the Eye of the Dragon, the Claws of the Dragon, and the last one, who is somewhere down here, Scales of the Dragon, are connected to Lee Sin, and they all, like, interact with his kit um, in one way or another. <clears throat> but yeah, similar situation, like, the cliffside and the place that she's, like, the, the waterfall that she's sitting by creates the framing of the character that helps, like, balance the composition to favor her. Highlighting the character, and then we have this lovely little dragon thing um, that, that, that kind of coils and curls around her, which also helps emphasize her centrality to the image. But it's also just like a really nice dynamic detail in the picture. And notice here that we don't have a Dutch angle. Finally, we don't have a Dutch angle, which I think is nice because this she's sitting there meditating. She's contemplating. It's a calm, quiet, peaceful moment where everything is at rest and she's contemplating the magic of the thing that she's holding on to and so on. I think Lee Sin's base also had... Yeah, it also has had a flat angle for the same reason. Like, a Dutch angle here would create this sense of energy and, ma and, and movement and chaos that a scene like that just doesn't need. It's the same thing with the inspiring mentor. No Dutch angles in sight. And then there's her dragonling, which apparently doesn't get its own card. Oh, well. Let's see. Scales of the Dragon. There you are. Some anime bullshit going on here, which is lovely. Uh, and again, the frame here is being created by his magic dragon. He's, I swear to God, if his line in game isn't Ryuga Wagateki Wakurao, then they have missed an opportunity. Um, but again, the, the ethereal magic snake thing here, dragon tattoo, helps section off his side of the image, then along with the, the flames and the little uh, the burning trees in the background, creates, like, the framing device for the dude in the foreground. I feel like the snake is a little bit... Like, it just looks like he drew the snake and then made it transparent. Maybe... Maybe screen filtered it over? I don't know. Something about this doesn't look like a magical specter. It looks more like a visual effect from a kung fu movie from the 80s which maybe maybe that's the point like maybe that's the visual reference it's supposed to make that it's like literally like a, a double exposure thing which is how they used to do the magic effects back in those days 
But yeah, much of the same stuff we've talked about already. Much of the same compositional techniques being used. Was that all of them? No, the horns. The horns is there as well. And here, interestingly, I don't think there's a clear frame going on. Like, you'd think there'd be one, like with this pillar here and that pillar there, creating a space for him to occupy. But I think the feeling that the artist is going for here um, is one of this guy being so powerful that he kind of bursts through. And you can see here that, like, uh, he's being attacked by presumably ninjas from Sed's Order of Shadows, throwing shurikens at him to very little avail or use. Um, so I think the feeling they want here is like this juggernaut-style unstoppable force kind of bursting out of any available frames that might contain him. Um, and there's a cool aesthetic going on with his with his skin and like with the way his body is designed. Like you can see the hardness. What's his... He's a 4-6 with double attack. Good lord. Um, you can see that he's like basically made of stone or rock made of mountain um, as someone says in chat just by the angular nature like look how angular everything every little shape and surface on him. there's no softness there at all it's just all sheer rock face basically and that seems to be at Fionia which means we can move on to Noxus Let's see, let's have a card list for Noxus so I can tell what I'm doing. And we'll start with the new champion. Get ready for more daddy in chat. There's Swain! <coughs> Commanding the Noxian Empire. Now here's an interesting compositional thing, actually, because this composition is really, really unbalanced. And what I mean by that is that there's this huge weight of detail and just, like, stuff happening here between Swain and the feathers and the crows and the flying around. There's so much detail and, and like, weight put in this side of the image that everything over here feels kind of insubstantial and flat. Not flat, um, floaty. A little bit. Like, this doesn't really have the, the same monumental power, and I think that's a little bit of a problem here because the image, like, the picture here is Swain commanding the Noxian armies to attack, and him, he himself out in front. And I feel like with this, you would want more of a Sejuani vibe, where you could see, like, the vast armies of Noxus arrayed behind him, like, with siege engines and powerful towers and stuff like that. Which, it kind of looks like that's what they're trying to go for, but I just don't get that. Like, this looks way too empty and... and, like... weak to really be supported by... Like, Swain giving the command and his crows flying forth. Like, there's an unbalancedness in this composition that I don't really like very much. Which is not present at all in his leveled up form. Where, oh, there's balance here. There's symmetry, in fact. And the symmetry here is being used to do two things. First of all, it makes Swain look like a terrifying avenging angel descending from on high to rain death and destruction upon his opponents down below, which is what's happening. Um, it helps compositionally in that the wings both constitute lines that lead to him, along with like this split, this red dyed split in the clouds, blasting open and Swain like standing in the rift like a demon out of hell. Um, but also, the symmetry of this image, like the perfect, uh, the perfect balancedness of this image, the symmetry gives a feeling of control. Like everything in this picture revolves around Swain. Swain controls what's happening here. All the lines on the ground lead back up towards him. It gives him this feeling of being in command and in power over what happens here, um, which works really, really well for the composition. Yeah, nothing there. Okay, next one would be the Imperial Demolitionist. Now, here's an anime girl. And this is Daole again. Like, this is just, this is an anime girl. Like, this is so, like, there's been some anime before, but this, for some reason, this one feels the most like an anime girl to me. Like, an anime girl from one of those weird fucked up anime where it's like cute anime girls, but they're fighting in like World War II <laughs> and driving tanks and being shot at and shit like that. It feels like that to me. She's cute, but it's it's there's a weird clash between like the semi cutesy aesthetic of the anime face and then like the fire and the brimstone and the burning and the jagged realism of the aura. 
there's there's a weird clash there. I don't think it's necessarily a bad clash. Like I think it 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 draws attention to itself in an interesting way, but it's a clash. Like it doesn't feel like it fits completely. <laughs> But again, same discussion as before. We have all of these trees and plants and stuff in the foreground creating a frame for her to occupy. And then we have the highlights on her body highlighting her against the background itself. The only place where that fails a little bit would be like here. I would kind of have like maybe I would have de-emphasized de the fire in the background here just in order to have that shine more brightly. But it still has the color saturation on the background. So it still stands out. It just could stand out a little bit more is really the only thing I mean. Which leads us on to... Is the Iron Ballista new? Yes, it is. So this one's a little boring. Um, this one feels most like a magic card to me of all the cards in the set so far. In the sense that magic cards also have a tendency often to focus on... Like, there's often inanimate objects in this way. Inanimate objects that are rendered in rather undynamic style. Um, because... You see, like, there's war elephants in the background, and there's Noxian soldiers running around, and there's arrows flying through the air, but the thing itself doesn't move. Like, nothing is really happening here. It's just standing there, ready to fire, but it's very undynamic, and kind of, to me, like, I know for a lot of people this stuff is really cool, but for me it's boring. Like, it doesn't... It doesn't really do much. It doesn't have a storytelling to it. It's just, it's standing there waiting to fire a thing. And it seems to be just one of many. So it's like, and again, this is this is one of those cards where it's like, it, it doesn't have to be cool or interesting because it's not a character. It's just, it's not a character. It's just a thing. So that's fine. Something better and more interesting, though, is the, is the City Breaker. Like, this one's a little more interesting to me. If nothing else, because here we've got a Dutch angle. Um, which we sort of, which like there's a little bit of one here, like just a tiny little one, but it's, it's also very stable with the line of the ballista itself. And so where the city breaker, because like the city breaker isn't standing there ready to fire. The city breaker has fired, it, like it has an action, it, it does something. The Dutch angle is a little bit more pronounced, and so like this feels a little bit more dynamic to me. Still boring, mostly. I mean, it's nice to notice that they're invading Ionia here, like that that's that that's what's happening. Um, but still not, just not a very interesting illustration. Functional, perfectly functional, and like it does the job that it's supposed to do, but. Not something I have a lot to say about. This, on the other hand, now this is better. Armored Tusk Rider. <laughs> this is still a war machine, essentially. Like, this is still a piece of, of war equipment. But here, because it's a character, it has action. It has movement. It has a thing that... that um, Tail of the Dragon! Shit, I missed the Tail of the Dragon. We'll go back to that in a second. Um... This has action. This has movement. Like, there's the swoop of the giant tusks, which helps. Like, this biological form that comes out. But then just also the fact that it has, like, legs that it can move around. It has a head that can swivel and look at things. Gives it much more of a dynamic feeling. Like, I think they could have pushed this even harder by having it, like, galloping rather than just kind of wandering forward. But this has much more energy to it, I think. Right. Tail. Where are you? There he is. He's behind a he's behind a spell card. That's why we didn't get to him. Tale of the Dragon. So here, a really fun frame, like a really cool frame. He's dodging these spear attacks from these enemies that are attacking him. And you can see that he's framed by them. They, they, they create this triangular frame for his body to occupy. And that triangular shape, that, that, like, that, um, that sharpness of that shape also kind of communicates the sharpness of him. Like that he's about to take... Like, he's clearly about to do a spin kick or something and kick all of their asses in one go. Um, 
but I really like that. I also like that he apparently seems to be mimicking Lee Sin's ponytail um, with this red rope that's coming, like that's tied to the back of his hair back here. Kind of seems that he's he's kind of mimicking Lee Sin in that way. Um, and again, the same highlight techniques that we've talked about before are being used here. There we go. That was the tail of the dragon. Back to Noxus. Uh, is there anything left here, actually, come to think of it? I think Aura Glinthorn is new. Is he? Yes, he is. So, Minotaur General Guy. A um, couple of cool things going on here. Like, first of all, same stuff as we talked about before. The sky behind him is bright, highlighted in pinks and golds and, 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 uh, and well, a little bit of blue up here, but mostly purple. And then he himself is very dark. Like, he's got this dark mottled skin going on, which is has his own highlights with the gold of his armor. And then he has these banners, like the war banners. The ones he's got hanging off the back of him are pretty cool because they add a lot of interest to his character. But the one coming off his mace, like this, I think is exceptionally cool because this looks like blood. This looks like blood flowing from a fresh, like from a mace that has freshly passed through some enemy's skull or something like that. You really get the feeling of like he's dragging this plume of blood through the air. That, Like that to me just looked really fucking cool as a bit of character design. And this, this right here has much more of the energy that I was looking for from the Swain card. This has much more of the energy of like he's commanding an army to move forward. You can see the might of Noxus like r rallying behind him, stones flying through the air, giant war machines, soldiers flanking him. This has much more of that commander energy. Um, that I was looking for. Legs too small, to be honest. No, he, well, maybe. He's got these digit grade feet, uh, this like bovine back legs, like he, with these coiled, where maybe the thigh should be longer. Hmm. It's a little unclear to me because I can't quite tell how he's standing there. And finally, the Leviathan, which is basically this card that summons Swain. Um, that's what it does. And round start, deal one to the enemy nexus three times, which is just mean and evil. And again, much like the other um, War Machine cards, this one is like... It's cool. I, I like that it has these three smokestacks, making it look like a modern steamer, like a, like a modern steamship or something like that. Like the Titanic almost has that kind of aesthetic. But it's also a very static. Like, it's not doing anything, it's just docking and... Like, war machines are coming out. Now, the scale is cool, because you have the scale of all of these tiny, tiny little soldiers, and even these giant war machine tower things are just dwarfed by the enormity of the Leviathan itself. But other than that, there's not much interesting to say about it. It stands out from its environment just by being stark black against an environment that's mostly bright. Pelto Ransan, second to last region. We're getting there. And it's only been three and a half hours. It does help that I feel like I've said everything that I needed to say. Kind of, like I've, I've talked about a lot of the stuff that I wanted to talk about already. Let's see, shouldn't Vi be up here? Oh yeah, right, I've already bought her, that's why. So, Vi has like a just a massively cool champion splash art. Like, I really fucking love this. Um, for two reasons. First of all, the dynamism. Like, it's a really, really dynamic artwork. There's lots of movement. There's lots of energy. Like, you can see the bricks from her running up the wall bursting out everywhere. There's, like, this this chaotic energy going on, even on the streets. And with the clotheslines and stuff like that, creating a lot of movement in the scene with this brick practically flying at the viewer themselves. Um, same thing that we've talked about multiple times before with her, it, with, the, with the cards where she's highlighted by sunlight, where everything else that, that doesn't need to be looked at is mostly contained in shadow. But then there's also the visual storytelling of this is Vi's personality. Like, this is who she is. This is what she does. She does collateral damage to everything, and she doesn't care. She's having fun. She runs up a wall, smashes buildings, leaves piles of bricks behind, and she doesn't care because she's about to punch someone right the hell in the face. As people are pointing out in chat, yes, Vi is a little bit too stick skinny to be wielding these giant power gloves. And Like, you'd think she'd be, at least have some muscle definition or something. But that goes back to her original character design, so I can't really put that on six more vodka this time around, because 
her original character design has those stick thin arms as well, which is like, nah, that's the way it goes. As people are, have brought up multiple times, by the way, Vi has a neck tattoo on the same side as her face tattoo, right? And it's not, it's not easy to see here, but it just kind of pokes out over her collar there. And then we get to the second image for her, and the neck tattoo seems to have changed place. Now, the other thing that I would suggest is that maybe Vi has a neck tattoo on both sides of her neck. Like, could that... Maybe that's what's going on. Um, I don't know if anyone's cross-referenced that with her original character model. Who knows? Um, but either way, that's a thing people have been talking about. So again, very, very tiny waist. Like, there's a... Here, there's a little bit of, like... Remember how I talked about with Misfortune? Like, it's not really about the character being realistic. It's about the character feeling believable. So here, Vi has this completely ridiculously tiny little waist, right? Which, like, I think it's still too much because, again, Vi is a brawler. She's someone who fights for a living. She should have much more muscle definition. She should have a much tighter core. Um, but because here we have this tight belt and this corset wrapped around her waist, it's, like, less uncanny to me because, like, instead of her just looking like she is that thin naturally, it looks like something is squeezing her really hard to make her that thin. Now, from a character design perspective, that still raises the question of why the fuck would she wear that? Like, Vi, the character who's all about breaking loose from boundaries and rules and not following, like, restrictions, why the fuck would she wear that? I don't know. Character design-wise, it's bad, but in terms of, like, the visual of, of the image itself, yeah, okay. Because, like, in real life, women can actually have waists that are that thin if they wear a really tight corset and a tight belt around it. I've seen that happen before. I've seen women who, like, do that for fun, and, like, that's part of their aesthetic. And it's cool that the human body can withstand that. It's also mildly terrifying. <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a character design thing that I don't think works on Vi, but as a visual design thing, it does make it easier to accept the idea of this just paper-thin wasp waist. Um, I think, yeah, I feel like that's more of a Caitlyn thing, really, as someone's pointing out in chat. Like, I feel like it's way more of a Caitlyn thing to be wearing a corset like that, because Caitlyn is uptight, and Vi is not. So, you know, as a character design, that would be a better... Anyway, the framing. The body of the man that she's punched the shit out of, as well as the rubble, and then the buildings themselves, you can see, create this frame for Vi to stand up in the middle of the image and kind of be framed by the sky itself. And I think... We're seeing, I think the lady there who's holding on to someone down there is the same one that we've got in the background over here, something like that. Maybe, I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, again, I love the visual storytelling here, which is that, like, she's <laughs> she's brought so much chaos and destruction, and th this guy right here is like, holy fucking shit! Um, is absolutely terrified by what she's done, and there's so much broken brickwork and just people lying in bundles, and this poor dude smashed, like, a half a foot into the wall itself. And then Vi is just standing there in the middle like, what? I was doing my job. Like, not giving a shit, because she doesn't care. Because she's Vi, and she's cool. And I like that. That works really well. Especially for the character herself. So, I think the first one is the two cost. Where the hell is it? There he is. Veteran investigator. Now, there's <laughs> a mustache on a yordle, isn't there? <laughs> so, um, to the best of my knowledge, the investigator cards all tell a unified story with the patrol wardens. See if I can find... Yeah, the insightful investigator. Like, this is the same scene, but we see it from different perspectives. Like, and we see, like, the, the big guy here being pointed in a certain direction is the same guy who's chasing... Here, who's chasing after Jinx in this image, I believe. So it's telling a unified story across multiple cards in that way. Let's see if I can find the last one. There is one more, right? Oh, no, no, that was all of them. Okay, cool. Um, so let's start with the veteran investigator. <laughs> so again, much the same uh, stuff with like the, the the sun being used to occlude the characters out there. You can see this is the same 
the guy who's pointing the guy in the right direction is the same one that we see with the insightful investigator out here, that thing. So again, highlightings from the sunlight coming in from the, from the roof overhead helps um, highlight the character, as well as this foreground object, like the barrel with this streak of fire cut across it, um, that kind of creates a foreground that he and the barrel or the box or whatever the heck this is all occupy together while everything else is kind of bathed in this occluding, almost misty, dusty sunlight that kind of washes out all the details. So he stands out that way. Um, more than by being brighter than the environment, he's slightly darker than his background environment. And then, like, just look at that mustache, man. That's a cool character design. Like, that's a character that has some personality to it, isn't it? Right, next up is the patrolman? Yeah, the patrol wardens. And then we have, like, clearly the person that they're chasing down is Jinx. And Jinx is not very far ahead because, like, she was just painting that right now. And she's dropping her paint cans as she's running off, like, just off screen. <laughs> with the wardens trying to chase her down. And I really like the physical acting here. Like, I like, like, the pose of, of the, the lady here who's, like, really leaning forward, like, 12 miles into the chase, fully in the run. And then the dude with the big cannon thing, or the siren, I guess it's a siren or something, just kind of loping after her because he's carrying this big thing with him. So he kind of has to have this more hunched over kind of Flintstones-esque run where it's, like, his legs doing most of the work. But also, the dude... Like, look at him, he's looking at Jinx's artwork with like a, huh, like that, that expression on his face is really good. I really like that. Warden Mir's sprinting technique was a running joke among other enforcers. Warden Keppel didn't get it. Yeah. <laughs> see. Okay, so one spell I want to talk about, Vault Breaker, because here we have kind of this is like the clearest possible demonstration of all that nonsense I've been blabbering on about about light and color used to highlight an object. Here you can just really, like, this is the most extreme possible version of that, where you can see, yeah, yeah, Vi is there, but this is the subject of the image. Yeah, but most of the spells just aren't worth talking about, I think. So then there's this. With, like, the veteran investigator on the inside, we have Warden Keppel here being pointed in the right direction. And then we have, uh, I don't know what her name is, this lady right here. And again, she is highlighted in the environment by being just simply darker than the rest of the environment. Like, she's got way more shade and shadow on her, where everything else is highlighted in this, like, late golden hour dusty sunlight in the back. And then there's the framing, um, where she doesn't have an explicit frame as such, but the perspective with the pier and, like, all the little lines, they're kind of leading into this wedge, this this triangular wedge shape that she occupies, making her the center of the image. Plus, she's gorgeous. Like, again, it's... it's I talk oftentimes in, when I talk about um, characterization... And, and, and character design, I talk about unnecessary sexualization. Like, artists who just like, oh, here's a lady, I guess, tits out and big ass. Or, like, t making them explicitly sexy in order to make them appealing and attractive. And, like, you look at a character like this and go, actually, you can make a character look pretty freaking hot without doing that. Like, there are ways to make a character look attractive without necessarily just using sexualization as a default. Um, which is something I'd like to see more of, especially in video games, that they, like, expand their aesthetic reach of what can be used to make a character look appealing. Because it's not about sexy being bad, it's about, like, it should be doing something, it should have a function beyond just, ha ha make my pee pee hard. Chief Mechanist Zivai. At age five, she made the world's first multi-frequency sonic knife. While not very practical, she mostly used it to slice sandwiches. It set her on the way to the Warden's Elite um, Armaments Department. And presumably this is the lady who, among other things, maintains vise gloves and stuff like that, I would imagine. So here again, framing. Here she's framed by her own working rig. 
Um, and the thing that she's working on, creating this little room right here for her to occupy. And then we have the light spilling out from the device that she's working on. Not really, like, not brightly highlighting her face, but creating this, this ghostly blue light that just does enough to bring attention to her. And look, she has muscle definition. She's not, like, mega buff or anything, but she has muscle definition. The kind that Vi really, really needs in her arms to look more plausible. So I love the visual storytelling here, that she has this this rig, this robot thing, which like holds up blueprints and like holds a, a tool in place and it gives her a cup of tea and it gives her a spanner when she needs it. Like it's doing, you get this sense of energy and movement that like while she's working, the rig is doing all these extra moves that are constantly bringing just the right thing into reach for her when she needs it, anything she needs, whenever she needs it. And if you imagine this being animated, like that, Imagine the motion that the picture implies, but happening for real. You get it. I think there's, this picture has such a really nice moving energy to it. Um, that can be kind of hard to do with robots in static pictures, is to give them that sense of movement, that sense of personality to them. Because, like, the rig, it doesn't have a face, but you still kind of... It still kind of has a personality, doesn't it? Like, with all those arms moving around. I think it's pretty cool. Was that the last one of Piltover? Yeah. That is the last one of Piltover Son, which moves us on to the very last region. We are almost done, my friends and fellows. Shadow Isles and Maokai, who's who I'm terrified of. Like, I'm terrified of running into Maokai decks. I'm like, this is so scary. <laughs> I don't want that! No! <laughs> I'm never letting anyone level up with this goddamn card. I'm killing them first, I swear to god. I'm just gonna go full early aggro and go for their face all the time. That's what I'm gonna do. Anyway. Maokai. So... For some reason, and I haven't been able to articulate why, but for some reason, this version of Maokai looks less cool and and, and kind of dynamic and interesting than the one we have in um, the submarine. What submarine? Did I miss one? That wasn't on my card list. What the hell? Oh, yes, it was. I just missed it. Okay. So this is a continuation of the, um, the cat mecha thing, Pursuit of Perfection thing. Uh, it's a continuation of that particular storyline with the kitty cat being used for mad science, um, and also doing mad science and trying to take over the world. It's pink here on the brain. Same techniques we've talked about before with, like, a framing being used to create a space of visual interest in the middle here. Light coming in, highlighting the thing, etc., etc. Much of the same stuff, but I do love the cat's expression. Like that determined... <laughs> the humans will pay. They will all pay. <laughs> like that. <laughs> that angry look it has on his face. Anyway, kind of impressive that through all of this, I've only forgotten like two cards. So anyway, what I was saying about Maokai. He's... I just don't think he's that cool and dynamic. Like, I think maybe it's because, like, in his base splash art in League of Legends, like, it has a lot of emphasis on the giant, powerful arm that he's got, like, his, his big magic treant arm. And then you have this tiny, crippled, little, weak-looking arm instead that has this asymmetric scariness to it that I really kind of like. But here, he doesn't really have a dynamic pose very much. Like, he's just kind of standing there. And the lighting, which is the thing that's that's been done so well in so much of the rest of the sets of cards, the lighting is really flat here. Like this, this just looks. It doesn't look like he's got a big hulking, like, uh, shapely body. Like this big knot of wood from out from which his giant his like giant head is poking. It just looks like it's kind of flat, and his head is copy pasted on there. Which is unusual, because so many of the other cards do this so well, and then Maokai comes along, and he's just kind of... Eh. There's just not that much happening with him. 
which I think is a pity. Um, compositionally, though, same thing. We've got this little bit of a framing in the background with, like, the light coming in from behind and the trees. And then we have the spirits that are all, like, rushing towards or around Maokai, kind of creating, like, an energy in the image that all points towards him at the center. Uh, which works very, very well compositionally, but just the character himself just isn't looking very good on this one. And it's kind of the same thing here. It's like... Here, he's pounding his fists into the earth, creating this splash of saplings and power and energy, and it's like... Like, compared to... No, not Ursine. Ursine. Like, compared to the energy in this, right? It's the same action, pretty much, but... But look how much more dynamic and active this piece is. And then you look at Maokai and it's like... It looks really static. Like, it really doesn't look like very much is happening. It doesn't look like he's pounding his fist into the earth. It looks like he's touching his hand to the ground, gently almost. Which, like, this is a picture where a Dutch angle would have been more appropriate. Like, where having that... that dynamic unbalancing would have been appropriate. This is a picture where I would have liked Maokai to lean much harder into what he's doing, like to really, to maybe distort the shape a little, like to get some more energy in there, which is really kind of missing. Outside of that, same compositional tricks, like we have the blue light of Maokai contrasting with the green light of, of life that he's pouring into the earth, and a framing with like the trees and the bushes and the stuff around there, doing a decent job of, of framing the action, even if the character himself is just not not compelling, I don't think. <laughs> Sapling. Kind of the same thing going on that we've talked about a hundred thousand times already. With, like, the foreground being created by the tree trunk that it's sitting on here, as well as the light um, coming onto it, and the light coming from the sapling itself. Creating much of the visual interest in the image and kind of pointing us towards looking at him primarily. I do like that he has these little... Uh, sapling buddies in the background, kind of these menacing little Joker faces that are just kind of hanging out and making the scene look more spooky. All right. Dun, 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 dun. Now, Thorny Toad, I think, is the first one, or Bark Beast, actually, no. So yeah, um, lots of Maokai-associated cards, basically. So I do like the visual storytelling here that the Bark Beast has clearly been eating. Like, it's it's been it's been sucking life or something out of this tree branch here that it's sitting on. So you've caught it right in the moment when it's eating. It looks a little bit like Cogmaw, doesn't it? Like, it has a little bit of that same aesthetic. Um, so there's a good visual storytelling here. And the same thing applies. Like, we have the foreground being created by this tree trunk poking up into it, the creature itself taking up most of the space in the image, and then, like, a background that's contrasted nicely against the creature. And nothing else really of interest. I like the spiky design on it. Like, I like that it's both thorny and a bark beast. Like, it's it's it, it really looks like a combination of different kinds of plant features into something that looks like a, a monstrous creature. Let's see... And then there's the Thorny Toad, which has kind of the same aesthetic to it. Like, it's the same kind of... It's barky and kind of uh, thick, but it's also got these spiky uh, bark aesthetic to it, almost as though it's covered with thorns as well, which also is in the name Thorny Toad. Last Breath, Toss 2, and Healing Nexus 2. <laughs> and again, it's highlighted, literally, by, like, this brighter patch of disgusting mud that it's wallowing in as it's, like, dragging itself out of the swamp. I like that there's a sword just kind of tossed on the ground and a skull um, buried in the mud, which kind of indicates that maybe he has eaten a few people before. Um, and I do like the idea of, like, having this almost like a shell like, this upper lip on the thing that kind of almost covers the whole body. Like, that's a, just a cool design thing, because it makes it look a little turtle-like, as well as being this this uh, clearly horny toad creature with slime coming out. It's just appropriately disgusting. And again, relative bright light in the center of the image, and then all around the edges, things get darker, which means we center our attention on here. The eyes being glowy with light draw attention to the face of the thing. 
Let's see. Blighted Caretaker should be next. There you are. Now, here's a character with some character. Here's something I really quite like. Um, because there's a story being told here. Like, there's a character interaction happening with... This guy has, like, an Ivor and energy. Like, oh, hello, little creature of the forest. And then Maokai Sapling is just like... Ah! <laughs> just, like, screaming at him. Like, fuck off! <laughs> Um, which is just a, a nice little bit of storytelling. And here also, interestingly for the Shadow Isles, a little beam of sunlight. Which is an unusual choice for a Shadow Isles card, because sunlight is a rare resource on those islands. Uh, a meaningless demon, yes. I know about the Subjectively videos, and I might do a video response to them at some point. Um, but yeah, I, I do like this character design. Like, I like the use of, like, this bright crown of, of leaves and, and, like, roots and branches being used to indicate hair. I like the gentle playfulness of her interaction with this screaming little shitbag <laughs> that clearly doesn't want anything to do with her. Now, the wood titties are a little bit much. Like, if you absolutely... Like, Usually when you add titties to a creature that isn't human, it's because you want people to intuit that the creature is female. Um, as a design decision, that's kind of what that's there for. I find it a little bit superfluous. Like, there's other ways to do that. But it's not it's not a deal breaker for me as such. Uh, like, it's fine. But what I do like is that she has the, like, the open maw on her belly. Like, like Maokai has on his arm, like this other face with his grinning, terrifying mouth. Um, and she also has that on her belly. And I kind of wish we could see her a little, like we, if she had like a second terror. She has this nice, pleasant, like sort of, sort of friendly wood spirit face. And then she has a terrifying ghost face with like a jagged mouth on the stomach. That's a really cool kind of character design. And I kind of wish we could see more of that as well. But again, light being used to literally highlight the interaction between the two as the main center uh, of the piece. And also she summons just regular saplings, yeah. And I think this is another new one. I got that one in my uh, weekly chest or my week, my, my uh, the vault thing. So, a couple of bits of cool storytelling that I like here. I like the swords that are sticking out of its back. Like, that's such a common thing on monster designs, like, to show that it's been around for a long time and has killed a lot of enemies. That goes all the way back to Moby Dick, by the way. Um, uh, where, like, the, the titular dick, um, the titular Moby Dick, yes, I know, snicker about it in the chat, um, is, is described as having, like, harpoons stuck into it, like, broken off from years of long hun hunts and stuff like that. Am I remembering that right? I think I am. Um, and that's the same thing here. Like, you can see all these swords and stuff stuck into it. You can see roots that have snaked out of the body and grown around the swords and spears. Almost as if to say, like, nothing you do can kill me in a meaningful way. Um, and the creature itself, again, this has this dark warm, uh, reddish-brown aesthetic thing going on, and everything else is blue and white and gray, uh, mostly. And then more storytelling that it grows plants wherever it walks. Like, it's full of this life force, life energy, and it creates life where it walks, which creates this ambiguity where it's a terrifying monster on one hand, but on the other hand, it clearly also is good for the Shadow Isles in some respect or another. Oh, and this is by um, Slavomir Maniac, which I don't know if that's a person or a, or a company. Uh, with apologies, like I'm not familiar with, with what kind of name that is or where it's from. But it's another one of the, the outside contractors that are working with Riot on this particular game. Oh, shit. No. Hang on. Units. Right. Um, next one would be the Neverglade Collector. That's a five cost. Ah, there you are. Now we're in Cthulhu land. Ah, we're Cthulhu now, boys. We're Lovecraft now. That's a mind flayer. Like, that's just what that is. That's a mind flayer, though. Like, it's a mind flayer. 
Uh, when another ally drains, drain one from the- Oh, god damn it! Don't ever play this against me, I hate you. <laughs> but yeah, again, many of the same things that we've talked about before. The trees in the background create a compositional space for the character to occupy. The light of the magic that they're using draws our attention to them. I do like the character design detail that the, it, this creature didn't build this boat. Like, the boat was, it's not, it didn't build the boat, it infected the boat. Like, it, it sank into it and burst through it and took it over like a parasite. I like that detail. Like, as a little thing, is like, oh no, this is not, it's like an anglerfish almost. Like, it's clearly preying on people. As it says, like, he bumped into Niven, this new ferryman. He rode us to... He can certainly hold a tune before. Must invite him to supper t soon. Recover journal. So, like, clearly this is someone who tempts visitors to the Shadow Isles and then drowns them and drains their life force. Something along those lines. Which leaves us with the overgrown snap vine. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> It can summon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> Why are there nine of them? Why? <laughs> what the dick? Anyway, when you summon a follower, kill it to summon an overgrown snap vine. So that's a... God, what a bastard. <laughs> okay, so... Um... Here we have a creature that's growing out of a pot. You see that? Like, uh, the idea here being that this is this... It's an overgrown snap vine. So this snap vine probably used to be small and harmless, as it says here. Today, another remarkable surf thing surfaced around blah blah. Children quite scared, but post no threat. Nuzzled, quite a trusting creature. Must forage them more berries. It's a shop of... A uh, little shop of horrors kind of thing where... You have this snap vine growing this little pot, and oh, that's cute, I'll feed it some berries, and then it starts growing a little bit too big, and then it starts growing really big, and all of a sudden, a lot of them start growing all at once, and all of a sudden, you have a big problem. And that's the visual storytelling here, that it's bursting out of the little pot that it used to be confined to, like this multi-headed hydra thing, spreading its roots through the earth and bursting out in other locations as well as it spreads itself. Feed me see more. Feed me all night long. Cause if you feed me Seymour, I can grow up big and strong. I hope you'll indulge me a little bit of musical. Which leaves us with this one more? Oh yeah, the Terror of the Tides. So this is a very, very cool monster design. Like, I really like this as a monster design. And again, it's like the same guys. It's the same stupid idiots who were chasing around that giant sea snake earlier. It's like, no, no, I can still get him. I can still get him. I've got him right in my sights. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is... Uh, <laughs> I just love that it's them again. Um... But this is a really, really fucking cool monster design. Like a monster, a sea snake, a sea serpent beast that's made up of the corpses of all the ships that it sunk. Like where you can see it's got this boat sitting on its head with the sails acting as like a, a, a fin on the top of its face. And it's got this broken prow of an ancient dead ship. Well, you can even see they have this ornament on the, on the front of the ship that was clearly like some kind of shark hunting vessel using that as a second layer of teeth in front of its actual layer of teeth. And then you can see even more boats and ships stuck on its back as this thing, like, curves itself in and out. And you can even see, like, its open splayed ribs in the ocean. Like, oh, this is a scary motherfucker. That's a really cool monster design. And that, I think, is it. That is... All of the cards, which me leaves one last thing I want to look at. Just, just, just the one. Just the one. 
the best spell in the game. The absolute best spell in the game. I'm going to be putting this in all of my decks, no matter if I have Poros or not. Um, Because this is the best spell. I love this spell. This is adorable. And you are wonderful, my little fuzzy friends. And I love you. It's such a bad card. Like, it's, it's, well, I mean, if you can get it on turn four, if you have three spell mana and you can get it on turn four, then I guess, like, having the two extra Poro snacks, like, it's still 13 fucking mana. And it's also, it's not clear to me whether it creates two random Poros in hand or on the board. It has to be in hand, right? Um, it has to be in hand, surely. Someone says the Trail of Evidence spell. I mean, yeah, like, it's still, like like I said, most of the spell cards are not that interesting as such, but you can hear, here you can see, like, the saturation of the color getting stronger and stronger the closer we get to the camera, and the trail of the, of the uh, goo itself being used to lead our eye to the investigator, as well as just, like, the, the framing of the investigator in this frame between the ground and the two things on the side. Same kind of, of, of um, general principles. Someone says the pool shark. Oh yeah, your point being that the pool shark is the thing that's hiding in the shell? No, I don't think it is. Um, like, I can see why you would think so. But I think this is the pool shark, but the way that he cheats them is by using this ball. that he, Like, this pet that he's trained to do what he wants. Um, but this thing is still the pool shark. Whew. Any other cards that you'd like me to take a closer look at? Uh, yeah, hmm. They're both pool sharks, that's the pun. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. That's a fair point. And yes, that's team. That's a uh, that's twisted fate on the poster. He's on a lot of posters. He's cheated a lot of people. <laughs> our boy, our very good boy, Kitchen. You should have gone to your meeting, man. Please look at the level up animations for the new cards. Yeah, I mean, if I have to do that, I'm gonna have to gather them first because I can't see them here. Like, I, I don't have a convenient way to just like, trigger them and see them. I have to, you have to actually level them up in game. So it'll take me a little while to, to get a hold of all of them. Legends of Runeterra gameplay now. No, that's not the point of this stream, but I might do a Legends of Runeterra stream at some other point uh, later. But for the moment, I think we are done. We have done all the cards, and I can feel my voice is slightly starting to hate me right now. I'm getting a little hoarse. Um, so, thank you all very much for watching, all 725 of you that stuck it out until the end. This was enjoyable. I'm gonna split this up into one hour segments, I think. I'm gonna try and split it up a little bit. And then I'm gonna put it on my second channel, uh, which is Tubi's Guide. You can find a link to that down in the description. And if you want to watch this and you don't want to watch like a five, four and a half hour VOD or whatever, four hours actually, a four hour VOD, then, uh, then you can go over there and find it. But other than that, yeah, I need dinner. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've had a good time sitting here with me looking at almost, almost all of the new cards in the new Legends of Runeterra Rising Tide expansion. Like I said at the start of the stream, Riot gave me a bunch of coins and a bunch of wild cards so I could unlock all the cards I wanted um, in the game, so full disclosure on that one. And yeah, I if they release another animated short, I'll be taking a look at that one as well. And if they don't, that's completely fine with me as well because I was almost burning out on them a little bit. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you to those of you who posted super chats and, and gave donations and stuff like that. That's very kind of you. And have a good night, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>